We will now begin the Ways and Meeting Committee for the St. Louis Board of Aldermen. Uh, for today, Sharita, please call the roll. Alderwoman Davis. Present. Alderman Vaccaro. Present. Alderwoman Howard. Alderwoman Hubbard. Alderwoman Murphy. Hi, uh, here, here, here. Alderwoman Spencer. Alderman Muhammad. Here. Alderman Odenberg. Alderman Boyd. Here. Alderman Clark Hubbard. Here. Chairman Balmer. Present. Seven present, you have quorum. With the quorum being present, we will uh, hold item number three, which is accused alderman until the end of the meeting. And with that, I'll move for approval of minutes from Wednesday, January 20th. I'll entertain a motion. I'll make a motion we approve the, meeting, the minutes from the meeting on January 20th. Second. Second. Thank you very much. Sharita, please call the roll. Alderman Davis. Aye. Alderman Vaccaro. Aye. Alderman Howard. Alderman Hubbard. Alderman Murphy. Aye. Alderman Spencer. Alderman Muhammad. Aye. Alderman Oldenburg. Alderman Boyd. Aye. Alderman Clark Hubbard. Aye. Chairman Balmer. Aye. Seven high votes. Sharita, thank you very much. You're welcome. We will move to uh, item five, which board bills for review. Uh, we originally had two bills, but Alderwoman uh, Tyus uh, needed some more time to get her speakers and things lined up. So before us today is only one bill, board bill 167 uh, from Alderwoman Rice. We do have, as I mentioned, or looked at, we have about 22 speakers lined up for the public speakers. We're gonna give you about three minutes each for your views, uh, but we will go to item number one. Alderwoman Rice, the show is yours. Please take over. Thank you so much, Chairman Vollmer. Thank you, Ways and Means Committee, for hearing Board Bill 167 today. Um, I do have a committee substitute that I would like to place in front of the committee um, that should be in the folders and you all should have received yesterday. All right, does everyone have the committee substitute before them? I, I, I did get the email, so I mean, if that's the one we're gonna discuss, I'll make a motion we put the committee sub in front of us. Okay. Well, I'll entertain that motion. Second. All right, Sharita, please call the roll. I say previous roll on this. Previous roll, hearing no objection, previous roll. We will now hear committee substitute for board bill 167. Please continue, Ms. Alderman Rice. Thank you. Um, and thank you, uh, Alderman Vollmer and Alderman Clark Hubbard for um, getting us this committee substitute in front of us here. So. Um, this bill was originally introduced back in December, and the reason for the committee substitute was uh, in major part because we needed to update the numbers. Um, this is a supplemental appropriations bill um, following ordinance uh, 71217 uh, that we previously passed. Um, and uh, this, the goal here is to implement our ordinance um, based on moving, moving the money around in the budget to actually implement ordinance 71217. Um, we are doing a few things here. Um, it is transferring some money into the division of supportive reentry, um, moving some money to the city justice center, the board of public service and the re-envisioning public safety trust fund. Um, so there are, there are significant numbers within the text of the bill itself, um, and then the uh, exhibits also kind of line out where that money is going to be going to and what the, uh, what the different departments are here. Um, so I have with me today um, uh, Noel Pfeffer, who is an attorney with Arch City Defenders, um, and he's their uh, Justice Catalyst Fellow. I think I got that right. Um, he's my expert here to come and speak on the bill um, and has done some significant work uh, here. So I would love to introduce him to, to help speak on the bill, Mr. Chairman, if that's okay. Uh, that'd be fine. Thank you for all your work on this issue. Uh, Noel, if you could, for the record, you have to uh, state your name and your position before we start speaking. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Alderman Volmer. 
Uh, my name is Noel Pfeffer. I'm a resident of the Sixth Ward and I'm a Justice Catalyst Fellow at Arch City Defenders. It's a pleasure to, after three years, be back before the Ways and Means Committee, and I'm looking forward to walking you through the bill you have before you, which will defund the workhouse and reallocate millions of dollars towards re-envisioning public safety and reparations. I want to start, however, by reminding us why we're here. This morning, I received two calls from pretrial detainees at the workhouse. One of them has been there, waiting for his trial for five years. The other, who was charged while visiting St. Louis, has been there for well over a year. He just wants to get back to New York. Both have been denied bail. Both describe freezing temperatures, negligent quarantine protocols, and rampant abuse of inmates. We are here to close a jail, which is as much a monument to white supremacy as any Confederate statue, and a relic of a failed arrest and incarcerate model of public safety. I could dedicate my entire testimony to detailing how we as a city have failed to protect the due process and humanitarian rights of detainees, but Others testifying today can speak to that more eloquently than I can. Instead, I want to speak to why we're here in a more immediate sense, which is that on July 17th, the Board of Aldermen, including each of you, voted unanimously to close the workhouse by the end of 2020. The bill's text invokes the board's power under Article 25 of the city charter to discontinue divisions and creates a clear duty to close the workhouse by December 31st, which the bill describes as the date to discontinue operations of MSI as a detention facility. An important point, this bill, Board Bill 92, was filed simultaneously with Board Bill 93, a blank supplemental appropriation intended to implement the fiscal provisions of section, section six and seven of Board Bill 92, which redirect the savings to the Division of Supportive Reentry and Re-Envisioning Public Safety Trust Fund. Board Bill 93 is still in this committee blank. And this reflects the fact that the city has failed to put forth a serious plan to close the workhouse. Instead, the administration has consistently undermined efforts to close the workhouse. Two members of Mayor Cruzen's cabinet, Health Director Elkills and Board of Public Service President Bradley, have failed to fulfill their legal obligations, missing key deadlines set out in Ordinance 71217. They owe the public multiple documents, including an evaluation of the City Justice Center's maximum capacity. This matters because the City's Corrections Commissioner has consistently downplayed CJC capacity. For example, a report put out by Commissioner Glass in September 2020 claimed that the only way to house 749 inmates would be to sleep 20 on the floor. Yet on November 16th, the CJC held 799 inmates. No one slept on the floor. And here's the kicker, we've since received access to the BPS report, which was completed back in June 2020. Its first page confirms that CJC was in fact built to house 860 detainees. Another element of misinformation that, that has come out is the claim that 131 jails in the state of Missouri were contacted to determine interest in housing city detainees. That's a quote from uh, the Commissioner Glass's report. And the truth, as we've since learned from Sunshine Request, is that the city simply sent out a single short email to a statewide corrections listserv and few responded. Jails across our regions have, have hundreds of open beds and are largely unaware that the city is looking for help. The administration even had the audacity to claim that it would take more manpower to run the city justice center on its own than the 326 individuals that the city currently relies on to operate the workhouse and CJC combined. While the CJC is currently staffed by just 237 correctional officers, Commissioner Glass told Paul Payne that he would need 356 employees in order to operate the CJC should the workhouse close. This resulted in Budget Director Payne's MSI expenditure reduction analysis memo, reaching the absurd conclusion that closing the workhouse would somehow increase the corrections budget. There is, to be clear, no staffing analysis to back up Glass's absurd claims. So that's where the city has left city jails, in chaos without a path forward, without a clear plan to close the workhouse. And though it's not our job, we felt compelled that we had to take action and we had to put forward a plan a plan that perhaps is not perfect, but that can move the conversation forward. And that's what Board Bill 167 does. It starts by defunding the workhouse, moving $3.3 million out of the corrections division and into the following buckets. We allocate $750,000 back to the City Justice Center to establish a proactive COVID testing protocol and to pay for the transfer of detainees into isolation. 
We also transfer $800,000 to the Division of Supportive Reentry, which would establish a case management structure and wraparound services for individuals going in and out of the carceral state. Of those funds, about half go towards paying the salaries of social workers, but the other half would involve direct payments uh, to folks leaving the carceral state. Um, we're talking about rental assistance, transportation vouchers, childcare vouchers, medical uh, costs, mental health payments, and more. This is all detailed in Exhibit B of the board bill, and it is really the reparations core of the bill. We are transferring funds out of a facility that has traumatized thousands of people and to a program designed to support and rehabilitate individuals. The remaining, well, actually there's $100,000 in there as well for facility decommission, maintenance and appraisal, which will go to the Board of Public Service. But the remaining $1.6 million will go to the re-envisioning Public Safety Trust Fund. $1.1 million will be allocated to ward accounts focusing on those wards with disproportionate levels of poverty and crime, which we identify through the HUD designated trauma zones and neighborhood revitalization strategy areas. The remaining 550,000 will go to three specific projects designed to re-envision public safety. The first is a community visioning process for the workhouse to figure out what its best use is moving forward. It may be that we need to sell it, which is why we're giving DPS money for an appraisal, but. A second piece is in funding and supporting and providing wraparound services for individuals at an intentional encampment, which would be detailed further through a future board bill, potentially board bill 97. Um, and finally, a sobering center, which would divert individuals struggling with addiction away from the carceral state, away from jails uh, and, and towards mental health uh, services. So that in short is how we're moving the money around. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions you all have, and I would deeply urge you to pass this out of this committee so that the full board can continue to debate this plan. Thank you. All right, thank you, Noah. And just to clarify things, Noah was signed up as one of the, uh, the uh, public input, but he is actually here as professional uh, with Alderwoman Rice. So I'm taking him off the list of uh, speakers. So we're down to 21. But uh, that is why we let him speak a little longer than three minutes we mentioned. So uh, he is here. And at this point, yes, I will open up uh, to questions uh, to the board, to uh, either the sponsor or to Noel. And uh, Alderwoman Davis, any questions? No, thank you. All right. Alderman Vaccaro. Just up to you. Um, I was trying to write all them numbers down. So the the... the what does all that add up to? How many millions of dollars? Because the, the, the total budget for the workhouse is 8 million. And there's the week, every one of the employees there has to stay employed. Uh, the, you know, anyway, I was trying to add up, what, are, what, are, what is, when you send all this money, uh, how much does that add up to? Sure thing. It adds up to $3.3 million, and you can find that breakdown in Exhibit A on page 11 of the bill. The reason it's not, so we defund the workhouse so that it will run out of money on April 1st, 2021. And the reason why it's not exactly a quarter of the workhouse budget, around $2 million, is because the corrections division is actually running over budget. And so we're also taking out those surplus funds so that the city can't then just move the money around and continue funding the workhouse. Okay. Well, you know, I'm not uh, uh, without, you know, uh, and then of course, uh, I, I assume Paul Payne's going to talk in this meeting today. Since I was so criticized about not having Paul Payne talk, or was he purposely left out of this again? I believe he's on the call. Um, and okay. I, you know, I spoke earlier today and he's welcome to, I invited him to present if he would like to as well today. Okay, good. Yeah, I was, uh, you know, but then. I mean, I, you know, I, I'll be very upfront. You know, I trust what Paul Payne had said in prior meetings. I trust what Dale Glass has said. And again, I have personally visited the folks in the Justice Center and they don't seem as anxious to close the place as, as the, the Close the Workout group does. So um, I'll you know, be very upfront. 
And that's, that's, you know, would I like to see that closed? Sure. Would I like to see the crime go away in the city? Absolutely. But, you know, I, you know, I just let you know up front that I've been sitting through this, these, these meetings for quite a long while and going to listen to everybody today, but, uh, you know, my issues are still, I think by doing what we want to do or what you all, what these guys are talking about wanting to do, I think it puts the people in the workhouse in a much worse position than they are now. So, but I'm going to listen, you know, I just, you know, that's, that's my issue. It isn't about closing the workhouse. <clears throat> it's about having the ability to treat the people in there properly, not shove them all over. You know, it's a good thing that facility was there when they were having all the problems where they shift the people over, um, you know, from the, from the justice center to the workhouse. Um, you know, I, I think the conditions in the workhouse are much more humane than the justice center. I think, you know, uh, and, and having, uh, visited both, you know? So I just want to explain where I'm at. I'm not opposed, I, but even at any point, but what I am, a, what I will say is that unless there's a plan that can actually close the workhouse and not mistreat the people in the workhouse by putting them in and again, I personally went in and talked to these people. It's not even like, um, you know, I mean, I personally talked to them. I was there with John Muhammad. We went in, um, you know, it, it isn't like, you know, I, I felt it's the place to go. I asked to close the workhouse group to, uh, along with Dan Gunther, to go over and visit the people in the workhouse. And they never did. Um, you know, and I would encourage that, you know. So, I mean, I'm just, just want to be upfront. I'm not opposed to closing it if the plan doesn't hurt the people that are in there now. But if it's just simply, let's close it no matter who we hurt. You know, and I stated this about Larry Rice. They shut it down. They didn't care. Now the people are living out on the street. So they said, they said the place was very terrible. It's horrible. It's, it should so they did it, so to fix it, now the people are homeless living out on the street. As, as I mentioned but, at the top of my testimony, we, I talked to two individuals in the workhouse this morning and we talked to them a lot, but what I would encourage you, and this plan is designed to serve them, but what I would encourage you to do is to set up a committee hearing where you can hear from detainees, provide them with Zoom access so that this committee can in fact hear directly from detainees because I think you're right, uh, you should. And I, I, you know what, I would not be opposed to that in doing it in public safety. If it could be set up, uh, you know, uh, and somehow, I, I think the problem there is that, you know, because uh, I've tried to do something similar where we can get testimony from people in there and they said it, it violates their rights. And I did go in and I have pictures and I can, show you them, I can send them up. But I have pictures, we, you know, I went through that place, you know, as little as, well, right before the COVID stuff was the last time I was in there. And I went wherever I wanted to go. I even went down in the basement where the boilers are at. I couldn't find the mold. You know, I, I encouraged them to have Elliot Davis go through and let Elliot go through and check every place out. I encouraged you know, I just I just want everybody to know where I'm at on this and why I'm where I'm at. I don't care about the building. I care about the people in the building. And if what Dale Glass is saying is true, which I believe, and after talking to people in there, it you know, it's not about closing a building. It's about the people in the building. And if we're gonna put them in a much worse situation, but we can say, hey, we won, we closed that building, you know, and it isn't like the person that you're talking about that's been there for five years, they're just gonna let him out. He's just gonna be put in a, a place where he's locked down for 23 hours a day in a much worse situation. 
you know, and uh, again, I, I I will ask again to see if if they will let us zoom. I am that confident that when you hear from the people in the workhouse, the majority of the people, I would say take a poll and send it through the workhouse and let it be anonymous where they can just sign up. You know, I think when you hear from the majority of the people in the workhouse, I honestly believe what you're going to hear is we don't want to be put in a worse situation. You're not proposing to let anybody out. All you're doing is proposing to close something and move them somewhere else. And that does not, in my opinion, help anyone. But anyway, I'm going to let everybody speak. I just want to be very out front. I know everybody thinks I'm a big bad meanie. And they'll say all kinds of bad stuff today about me on Facebook. I think, you know, maybe, maybe you know. Anyway, right, gonna, ready to, right, does that close it out for you, Alderman? Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna, right. I'm gonna, Thank you very much, sir. All right. All right. Alderman Howard is not with us. Alderman uh, Tamika Hubbard, any comments or questions? Uh, oh, Jessica, go ahead. Can you hear me, Mr. Jeremy? Yes, we can. Okay. I've, I had to switch between devices. That's why I was a little uh, late getting on. I just um, have a comment. I, I definitely uh, do welcome the continued conversation, I think, but. Uh, I'm kind of taken back in a little ways because uh, with all due respect to Noel, I, I know his expertise, I know his skill set. We worked to, uh, together on many projects with the uh, city. So I, I know that he's very knowledgeable, but I do know too that if in a different capacity, probably working for the mayor's office, he would have a totally different view on what we're saying because he would uh, be put in a capacity to justify a, a counter to what's being said here. That's just his skill set and I know how he works. But I just hope that um, going forward, I'll stand by my decision on it until uh, such time a plan is presented um, that where we won't place any undue hardship on the offenders that are there and their families. Then I just don't think it's feasible based on the information that has been given to me by the experts in the lane, the people who have 40 and 50 years of experience, who know correctional standards, who have worked in uh, Missouri prison systems, which is a world of difference from uh, a local jail. But the, the standard of, of care is the same in many of these places. So, you know, I, I get it that um, this issue has been sensationalized. Uh, I think when you when you will call, a, if you were to call it a offender uh, forward and ask their um, position on what, how the conditions are. I mean, you can find people on both sides of that issue. I mean, it, it all depends on who reaches out to them. So I don't know if that's the best way to go. I, I know that uh, we were elected to lead. I know that uh, as a city, I have a, a lot of respect and regard for us as a city and as a corrections department to know that we wouldn't be having people living in um, horrible conditions, not this day and time. Now, 20, 30 years ago, my mother worked there there was some sketchy workhouse issues. Uh, I was a seven and eight year old walking down the halls of the uh, city workhouse. And it, back during the time when they let people roller skate. So that's how above and beyond even back then, those were the type of amenities our correctional system had in place to just make um, a person stay a little bit better while they were there. And um, when, when we have made a lot of transitions over the years and have definitely upped the level of professionalism, up the level of professionalism when it comes to the staff and just everything that abides by uh, higher uh, correctional standards, then I'm not all into the shock and awe comments that often come across um, out here in the public regarding this issue. I feel it's an issue that people are very passionate about. I, I definitely condemn the sponsors because they have sold people a dream that they knew two years ago was not totally feasible for us to do as a city. We couldn't handicap our city in that way. And so there's a lot of stuff put out there. I mean, I know some people personally who are on payroll for this particular organization, who I see out in the streets and in bars and places, and they tell me that they've gotten on these calls because they're actually being paid to get on these calls. So I just um, hope that we all can uh, constantly be above board and know that we do have an issue on our hands with the workhouse, but just know that it won't, the change won't happen overnight. You can't address prison reform and 
all of this stuff at the same time we're trying to keep our population down so there, there's many issues going on and some of it doesn't even sit in our lap you know we're not judges we don't let people uh come or or, or go so it's just it's a big mess right down to me and for lack of a better word i'll call it that but i do know i don't know anyone who could uh be more passionate about offenders you know i've, I've spent a lot of time and effort dealing with offenders in many capacities in um government so i just i just don't like uh the way that it's going i know everybody has a job to do i know everybody has an agenda but if you truly care about the people that are incarcerated there are the people who have uh disproportionately been incarcerated people who look like me black and brown people who for years have been uh disproportionately incarcerated because we have a systemic uh problem in our country i just think that you we need to look at what's in the best interest uh of them because I guarantee you if you send them three hours away where they may be racially profiled where they may their families may not even make it back I mean they they probably wouldn't even feel comfortable going into Walmart if by chance they had to stay overnight uh due to a car breakdown or just something trying to see their family and I know that because I, I've lived that on many different sides of the issue and I've worked in that and I've uh, had training as a correctional officer when we were down in Park Hills, and after our trainings were over, they would tell us it wouldn't be a good idea to go to Walmart because uh, you're you're in between Farmington and uh, Potosi, and you know people like me aren't a regular fixture in those communities. So I I just hope that um, we could really be about the business. Uh, we could put the the research out there to see what it would be more feasible for us to do as a city regarding our our problem. And I would like to move forward that way. I, I'm just tired of the game being played back and forth. And especially when people say an organization is filled with black people, it's not. You, there's no way you can tell me that because nobody black has knocked on my door uh, in a community I've been living in for five generations and said anything to anybody about closing the workhouse. Now, I mean, you may have went downtown or somewhere, but you didn't come to Car Square. You didn't come to uh, Murphy Park. You didn't come to um, maybe one or two doors of Old North, but in, in the trenches of the community that I represent that probably house many of my constituents, I guarantee you weren't walking around asking them if they if they closed the workhouse, would they be amenable to being uh, shipped three hours away? They'll tell you no. If you go to Clinton Peabody, they'll tell you no. If you go to any impoverished place in North St. Louis, they will tell you no because they know what they face you know, trying to see a family member under those conditions. So uh, that's all I have. Uh, I just hope that we can move forward and be productive about what the real issue is. Thank you. All right, thank you, Alderman Hubbard. Uh, Alderman Murphy, any questions or comment at this time? Uh, not at this time. I said a lot of my sentiments have been expressed before. Uh, I said we all voted, um, we voted unanimously to have a plan to close the workhouse. I think all of our hearts are in the right spot. We want what's best for everyone, the city residents, the, the people that are incarcerated, not by me, but by judges and, and whatnot. And uh, I, want to, I want to keep an open mind and listen to what everyone has to say today. So that's my comment. Thank you. And Noel, it's good to see you. Thank you, Alderwoman. If I could make a brief comment um, on Alderwoman Hubbard's point about how detrimental sending detainees three hours away would be, because I completely agree with her on that. I wanted to highlight that Exhibit C um, limits eligible bidders to correctional facilities and hotels within 50 miles of the city justice center. Because if I were at the mayor's office, I'd be doing exactly what I just did today, putting forward a serious plan to close the workhouse, which actually transfers individuals currently in the workhouse to prevent overcrowding to again, correctional facilities and hotels within 50 miles. I don't know why the city has not issued an RFP to do so, but this bill would do so. All right, thank you, sir. We'll move on to Alderwoman Spencer. I believe you joined us. Any questions or comments? Alderwoman? Okay. She's having problems, we'll come back. Alderman Muhammad, any questions or comments of the uh, sponsor or, or uh, council? Thank yeah, yes, yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Alderman Rice, um, were Commissioner Glass and Director Edwards invited to uh, speak? I'm sorry, Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, the odd woman from the 20th Ward just wrote in chat that she's having- She uh, said, uh, 
Uh, Alderman, uh, thank you very much, Alderman Muhammad. Yes. Uh, Alderman Spencer, oh, I, we cannot hear you. That was your question that you put up. In, uh, is, are you muted or I'm... Okay. So STL TV, is there a problem getting her audio? She's not muted. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what, we'll, uh, okay, if we, if we can't get her audio right now, we'll move to Alderman Muhammad and we'll go to her, uh, return to her, if that's okay. Uh, if you can, uh, let me know when you get her audio, feel free to break in. You won't mind, will you, Mr. Muhammad? I will not. I will yield whenever the other woman is ready. All right. Thank you, sir. Uh, please continue to uh, we can get hold of Alderman, Alderman Spencer. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Alderman Rice, were Commissioner Glass and uh, Director Edwards, were they invited to participate in today's committee hearing? Yes, they were. Um, the uh, commissioner is involved in, a, in another meeting and is not able to join. And um, Director Edwards said he is working on vaccinations for the first responders today. So he is also not able to join. You're muted, Alderman. Thank you, Alderman. Woman. And I'm sure that they have uh, expressed to you their concerns about this board bill or about closing uh, CJC or, uh, or about closing MSI. Have they expressed to you the concerns that they have had, uh, which has been consistent over the last three years? Sure. Yeah. And some of those we actually did attempt to address in this board bill and the committee substitute, um, including a rigorous COVID-19 testing protocol uh, for detainees as they come in so that we can hopefully prevent infections within uh, the Justice Center entirely um, and and further. I mean, that was, that was one of the big ones is uh, that we are in the middle of a pandemic and we are not trying to deny that and the complications and challenges that come along with that. Um, but we were also I, admittedly a bit taken aback that um, during the health committee meeting, we heard that only 694 detainees have been tested for COVID-19 over the past year. Um, and there, you know, we have 800 people who have been, who are, who are currently detained, and that's not taking into account folks that have come and gone since then. So I, I frankly, we could have a much more significant uh, COVID-19 testing regime in place um, so that both staff and detainees are safe and we won't need as much space for um, isolation and quarantine. So that is exhibit C, if uh, $769,878 um, will go into continuing to maintain uh, the City Justice Center to the level necessary uh, for current detainees. Mm. Okay, thank you, Alder Woman. And just, just one more question. Sure. Uh, the, the board bill talks about the we envision a public safety trust fund, yeah. right? Uh, just, just for transparency, can you break down that trust fund for me? Uh, Absolutely. Uh, thank you. Happy to do so. Um, and particularly for members of the public, um, I do apologize that it's harder to get committee substitutes. Um, we did try to email some things around uh, so folks have access to them. But um, so this includes $500,000 shall be deposited into the citywide account of re-envisioning public safety trust fund. Um, so. The project number one is reimagining the workhouse is $200,000 um, that would go towards an RFP process conducted by the comptroller um, to work on what was what would be MSI, uh, the future operations of MSI, what that building would be used for going forward. Number two is the intentional encampment. That's $250,000 there. Um, and that is to, uh, to handle what we are what we are seeing with significant increased unhoused population and folks being continually um, evicted from those encampments um, and moved around to hotels way far out in the county. Um, not we have people uh, we have empty uh, tiny homes that uh, folks cannot even access right now. So we are we are working with um, the COC and others um, on an intentional encampment uh, that would protect the rights and the. Uh, the living, the living quarters, basically, of uh, people who are unhoused right now. Um, and then project number three is federally qualified health centers as alternatives to incarceration. So this is um, dealing with, um, you know, how could we if, if people need to be detained, are they needing to be detained for healthcare reasons, right? Is it because they need to detox safely? Um, is it because they are in a danger to themselves? Um, can we contract with a federal, federally qualified health center um, to, to care for them as an individual um, in, a, 
in a um, medical capacity in a way that uh, would not would could take place outside of the city justice center. Okay. Thank you, uh, uh, the woman. Um, and this might be a question for you or for Nayil. Uh, Nayil, no, am I saying that correctly? Noel. Noel. Okay. Uh, no, I apologize. Thank you, Noel. Uh, in regards to the, you know, the commissioner sent out a uh, a letter to uh, all of us uh, in the board of aldermen, uh, giving us a list of facilities that will accept prisoners or inmates from uh, the workhouse. Um, do you have Do you have that list, Alderman or Noel? Do you have that list? I do not. Okay. Unless it's the, unless it's the one that was included in the report, seven one two one seven report. Yes, that is it. That's it. That's it. So it's just so, St. Miller County and St. Francis County. Right. So with those two uh, facilities, do you think that that is in the best interest of the inmates that we have here in the workhouse to be transferred to those counties? And I'm asking for, for several reasons because I I have families uh, in my ward uh, and their loved ones are in the workhouse and it is five minutes away <laughs> uh, down Hall Street as opposed to being an hour away or two hours away or even three hours away. Uh, do you think it's in the best interest to transfer our inmates to a Nella facility? Um, not, not at all. And in fact, St. Miller and Francis County are explicitly excluded from the eligible bidders um, for this RFP. Um, and the reason that there were only two respondents is, again, that it was a short email sent out to a listserv, not directed outreach and not attached to a specific request for proposals, which is, again, what this bill would do. Okay. Right, I agree with that, um, Alderman Muhammad. That what we are asking for is a formal request for proposals to be sent out to jails in the area. Um, it was the experience of folks doing research after that report came out um, that there there had not been an, a, enough awareness to some of the jails nearby that may have space to be able to move folks to. I know um, St. Anne is one of those jails that has recently been, that's a newer jail. Um, and I know that uh, that has served as overflow space for the county as well. Um, and it is a higher standard um, jail facility. So that is one that is one of the, the possibilities that we could be contracting with that is a whole lot closer than St. Francis. Okay. Uh, and and so back to the cost savings, right? Because under this board bill, of course, there's a significant cost savings. Have these numbers been verified by the director of the budget? Have they been verified by the comptroller? Um, we don't have a financial analyst anymore, uh, but have they been verified by those who are responsible for public dollars? Like, are we actually gonna see a significant cost savings uh, if, if MSI closed? Like, has that been verified? And not to knock the expertise of you, all the woman, or, or you, Noel, but, but has this been verified by those who are actually in control of public dollars here in the city of St. Louis? No, they have not at this point. And I'm really looking forward to Budget Director Payne's testimony. Um, they are based on the numbers that Budget Director Payne shared with the Public Safety Committee pursuant uh, to the directive of Section 8 of Ordinance 71217. That included an estimate of the cost savings associated with closing the workhouse by the legal deadline of December 31st. So that gave you a half a year of budgetary savings. I've adapted that analysis um, to estimate the savings from a quarter year, but frankly, I've also adopted some slightly different assumptions with respect to the additional costs associated. Um, where, for example, the budget director assumes a need for 356 staff at CJC. Uh, this actually keeps staffing costs roughly the same, with the exception of adding three new positions in order to prevent any possibility of job loss. And I'll add on to that. Um, the the budget director is on the call today. Um, he was invited. I don't know for sure that he wants to speak. Um, that I will leave that up to him. Um, but we did want to uh, continue to thank him for meeting his obligations under Ordinance Seven One Two One Seven. Um, he uh, that that just needs to be said. Um, so there are there are some places that we do disagree. Uh, and some things that have changed since his uh, most recent budget analysis. Some of that also has to do with more vacancies in, uh, in jobs for um, uh, corrections officers at both CJC and MSI. So there are, there are a few more open jobs 
there as well than there were back in October. Um, and, and some other, there are, there are some other uh, discrepancies and, and we welcome um, the conversation. We welcome amendments if necessary as well. Um, but this bill, Ways and Means has the authority to, uh, to do budget allocations, uh, to, to do these type of supplemental appropriations. Um, it is also subject to the board of ENA. So the comptroller, um, the mayor and the president of the board will also have direct weigh in uh, as this bill goes forward. Thank you. And, and I know you mentioned the ordinance that passed uh, you know, earlier this earlier this session, uh, board bill 92, I believe, uh, by the president. Um, and, and, and I know we keep we keep making a reference that we voted to close the workhouse uh, by December of 2020. And when you read the language, it doesn't say that we're going to close the workhouse. It says develop a plan to close the workhouse and it directs the commissioner of corrections and the director of health, uh, along with the president of the Board of Public Service to develop a plan to close the workhouse uh, in the event that it is feasible. Um, and we have received some reports from uh, uh, from the, the the interested parties. Uh, all of them, would you, would you say that we have received all the necessary reports from all the necessary departments that we were supposed to receive under this ordinance? Have we received that in a board of aldermen? No, I don't believe we have. So do you? So so basically, we are not, and, and we do this a lot uh, here in the city. We are not. Uh, we're not obeying the law. And we have not received the necessary information that we need in the Board of Aldermen to, to do our work and do our due diligence as it relates to closing uh, MSI. Would you agree? I would agree. Thank you. Uh, and Autumn, I know uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we heard Board Bill 212, I believe it was. It was sponsored by uh, Alderman Jeffrey Boyd, who I uh, wanted to put it to the voters, a non-binding question to see where our city was in regards to closing MSI. Uh, do you support that uh, initiative or not? No, I don't. I think that we have, uh, we as representatives of the people have already, um, have already taken action towards closing the workhouse. I think um, Board Bill 92 stated that it would direct the Commissioner of Corrections to begin the process of closing St. Louis City MSI. Um, we, we have started that process. I think that um, voting or asking the public to vote on that, it would be um, deferring, deferring the job that we have already started out, that we have already set out to do. So no, I don't agree that it should be sent to the voters. Okay. Understood. And I just want to uh, just just for transparency, the board bill says this board bill will direct the Board of Public Service and the Commission of Corrections to evaluate the city justice center to determine if more detainees can safely be held there and perform a study at a mean security institution to determine the feasibility of repurposing and to evaluate the ongoing cost of any plan to permanently close a facility. I just want to make sure that that, that we have that uh, noted because that's what the board bill says as I'm reading it right now introduced by President Reed on July 2nd, 2020. I just want to make sure that's in there because it, it again, it, it leads to saying that we will develop a plan to close if it uh, is feasible. Uh, it does not say we're going to close the workhouse by December of 2020. We will develop a plan to close the workhouse by December of 2020 if it is feasible uh, and if it makes sense. Uh, and I guess that, that leads me to my last question, other woman. Uh, uh, does it and I honestly don't know. Um, I don't know why I am on the issue, honestly. Uh, I would love to see MSI closed, but now without a proper plan, uh, almost like war reduction. Uh, I would actually like to see war reduction with a proper plan, but we don't have that uh, with either of these two processes. Now I'm just asking, does it make sense to close this facility without the necessary documents that we demanded by law that we really don't have and uh, have not received. Uh, does it make sense to close this facility without those documentations, without the, without the studies that we need? Does it make sense to close it without having a real uh, transition for the uh, people that are in MSI? Does it make sense? So I think a couple of things to respond to there. Um, the the beginning of Board Bill ninety two 
is what I was quoting when I said, um, directing the commissioner of corrections to begin the process of closing uh, the St. Louis medium security institution. So that that is what I'm quoting. And I, I realize that that is in the introduction of the bill. Um, but but I do I do agree that there needs to be a plan in place. And that is why we've brought a plan. We are we are bringing a plan to close, to remove the funding for the workhouse as of April 1st, right? We're still in January. There is time, there is time to submit a request for proposal. There is time to follow the directions they contained in board bill 167 um, to have a plan in place uh, to, to move this forward in a responsible manner. Um, we are not trying to jeopardize anyone's safety or their access to justice. Um, this is a this is a step in the process. Um, this is something that was, it was actually contemplated um, by the president when he introduced board bill 92. There was, there was a companion board bill 93 that was a supplemental appropriations uh, bill that was supposed to come along with it. So this was always intended to be the next step of the process uh, as it came through the board of aldermen. Um, so that is what we are attempting to do here today. And like I said, there is time um, in the interim here. And, uh, you know, I we agree that you know, the Justice Center is not the end-all be-all of criminal justice in St. Louis. That is, we are in the midst of ongoing um, continued uh, changes, right? We, um, Arch City Defenders, the Bail Project, um, organizations that have have pushed us every step of the way, whether through lawsuits um, or through actual practice of defense of their clients, um, to change the way that bail is allocated, uh, to change who is held uh, pre-trial, how long they are held pre-trial. Some of that guidance has come from the Missouri Supreme Court. Um, and we, we continue to push in that direction uh, to support people as they are awaiting trial um, in a way that ensures that they, or all but ensures that they are going to show up uh, for trial um, and that they do not lose their livelihoods uh, while they are awaiting trial uh, merely because they've been accused of a crime. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, sure. Uh, one, one more question. Uh, if, and, and you're a lawyer, so uh, I'm going to play you uh, today, okay? So if, if I was Andy Rice and I had uh, a defendant at, at, at a client, an MSI, uh, and the city says we're closing MSI, we're going to send this, this person to, you know, another facility. Uh, would you be okay with that as a lawyer? Uh, first of all, can you take on my student debt to go with my law degree? That would be great. <laughs> if we're, uh, if we're only, only if you take out mine. Okay. Um, so, you know, I think that's, it's a good question. And that is why the bill contemplates a, a specific radius to where uh, people can go, uh, can be moved to so that they still have access to their attorneys. Um, before the city of St. Louis took on some of the federal detainees that we are currently holding, um, those folks were sent to other uh, jails in the region as well, even though their charges or their cases were being heard in St. Louis city. Um, so this is not, it's not unheard of. Um, and, you know, going to St. Anne versus going up to Hall Street, um, you know, it's not all that much different. Um, and that the goal is to keep people as close to home as possible, um, but to put them in better facilities. So, and reducing the jail population overall. Okay. Uh, and I understand that. Uh, and again, as a lawyer, would you be okay if your client was moved? Um, just up out of nowhere overnight. Would you be okay with that? Or oh, in this bill, and I don't see it in your bill. Uh, but I don't know if there's policies under the uh, under the department or the division that would govern this. Uh, but would there be some type of communication help between lawyers uh, and clients in regards to uprooting people from uh, our city? Sure, folks would not be just uh, moved overnight. Um, Noel looks like he has some comments on this, so I'm going to let him speak on it. Uh, the bid that uh, is issued for the transfer must include a, a detailed documentation, um, notice of the transfer to the detainee, family members, any attorney representing the detainee, and the court at least one week in advance of the transfer. One week. That's right. Okay. And Noel, do you, do you think that is a sufficient amount of time? I mean, you're always trying to make a balance between practical considerations on, on both sides. You don't want to make the transfer impossible, and you do want to provide a possibility for notice and talking to uh, 
public defenders impacted in detainees. We felt that one week uh, struck that balance, but I would welcome an amendment um, if this committee uh, feels that a different uh, balance should be struck. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, will the uh, will Director Payne be speaking today? Uh, I will, once we get through this first round of questions and comments, I, I will see if he has any things he would like to input and then we will go to the uh, public input after that. So once we get through the first round uh, with, with the committee members, and we actually have a couple of aldermen, I have received a request from some aldermen attending this meeting who would like to also interject. So we'll go through all those and I'll ask Mr. Payne if he has any input. And at that point, we will then go to public input and come back after that. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, if I have any questions, they'll be directed towards Director Payne. Uh, all right, no, sir. Further no further comments. Trevor Carwell, you're my friend. <laughs> Thank you, Alderman. Okay, do we have uh, Alderman Spencer or have you got your audio working yet? STL TV, is she available audio wise? That's STL up. TV, are you available? Know, yes or not. Okay. We, Mr. Hearing... Chairman, she, she put it in the <laughs> chat that she didn't have any questions at this time. Okay, thank you very much, Madam Vice. That's why you're there. I'd be lost without you. Okay, at this point, we will then go to Alderman Oldenburg. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the committee, um, I'm not sure if I direct this to the sponsor um, or her hired lobbyists, but let's go with the sponsor. I just wanna make sure mechanically I know what's happening here. Uh, we're amending the city's operating budget for 20 fiscal year 2021 and we're shifting line items that operate MSI to the special fund that was codified in ordinance 7127 and we're calling that a supplemental appropriation and to be budgeted for in fiscal year 2122. Do I have that correct? So there's two pieces. Um, the first piece is the reallocation of funds for the current budget year. The second is a directive for um, the following year's budget. Right. So it's the reallocation that, that we're ca categorizing as a supplemental appropriation? Correct. Understood. I've never seen a supplemental appropriation that's this convoluted. Have you, all the women? Uh, we don't do these very often. So no. I can't say that I have. Typically, um, it wouldn't it wouldn't be going through another ordinance, but I guess since the special fund is 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 enacted in law, that's right. your step. Wouldn't it have just been easier to reach out to the sponsor and the drafters of Board Bill ninety two, um, and 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 work on um, expediting the the plans that were made in that than what we're doing here today? I don't I don't know that I. Well, no, because this, you know, like we have talked about, Board Bill 93 was introduced as a companion to Board Bill 92. There was always going to be an appropriations bill to go along with that original ordinance. Right. But but wouldn't it wouldn't it have been easier to work through the what's what's existing now um, with with the sponsors? and the drafters of that bill? Well, nothing currently exists right now. If you look at board bill 93, it is, it's pretty blank. Okay. Who sponsored board bill 93? Do I know? President Reed. Okay. And is he aware of these changes and, and in support of them? Um, do you know? I have not spoken to president Reed about that. Um, I don't, yeah. I have not spoken to President Reed. Yeah. Okay. Hey, thank you so much, Alderman. Uh, I know there's a lot of folks that want to speak today. I have a few more questions, but I will reserve those uh, till we get through all the speakers. Thank you, Alderman. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Alderman Oldenburg. Uh, Alderman Pam Boyd, any questions or comments for the sponsor or her return? No, no questions. All right. Thank you, Alderman. Alderman Shamim Clark Hubbard, any questions or comments? I don't have any questions right now. A lot. Of, I had some questions, but thank you again, Noel, for taking the time out to talk with me last night and explain some things further to me. And I'll just be here listening in. And I do hope we get to hear from Budget Director Paul Payne as well, but everybody knows where I stand, so I'm here to listen. All right. Thank you very much, all the women. 
I will hold mine for the end. We do have, if Alderman Spencer is not available, uh, we have some Alderman. I have received, uh, Alderman Boyd is online and has requested to uh, have a question or comments of the sponsor and her counsel. So Alderman Bard, are you with us? I am here. All right, please proceed, sir. Um, yes, I have a few questions and comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first of all, I, I'm gonna suggest that this board bill seems pretty pie in the sky. Um, if my good friend, Alderman Bosley Sr. was here, he might say, this is putting short pants on people. Um, and what I mean by that is there's a lot of policy embedded in this board bill, which dictates the administration of um, departments within city government. And we generally don't do that. Um, this bill has been presented as a supplement appropriation. Is there an echo? Yes. I, I, I hope I don't think it's me. Um, anyway, uh, it's been presented as a supplement appropriation. I was on Ways and Means for about nine years, so half of my career on Ways and Means, and I learned quite a bit, uh, especially from Professor Paul Payne. And to me, this is not a supplemental appropriations bill. Um, and a, su a supplemental appropriation bill would actually be adding funds to a bill that, a budget bill that has already been presented and passed. So we do supplement appropriations often, just like with all the COVID um, monies that's coming out. Those are supplemental appropriation bills. Um, this bill reallocates funds that has already been allocated in a budget that we've already passed. And my understanding is ENA is the only entity that can move and reallocate funds, not the Board of Aldermen. We can approve a supplemental appropriations, but we cannot reallocate funds. And Paul Payne can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so I have, so I, I'm looking forward to hearing what he has to say about that. Um, can, Alder Woman Rice, can you tell me who's responsible for pre-trial and who's responsible for the length of time detainees? stay in the workhouse or the justice center? Sure, so pretrial services can uh, can happen in, in a number of ways. Um, we, the circuit attorney's office can run pretrial services. Mm -hmm. um, the, the justice center itself can run pretrial services. I have taken a, I took a tour um, back, oh, I guess it was 2019 now um, with the uh, police department's uh, I don't remember if he's a lieutenant or not. I'm sorry, I'm blanking on his ranking, um, but working within the city justice center and he was showing me the work that even the police department has been doing on pretrial services um, and, and trying to move people through the justice center as quickly as possible when they can be released on their own recognizance. So there's a number of different entities that work on pretrial. Um, the as far as the length of time being set so you're you're talking about bail, you're talking about um, pretrial detention, um, that is the, at the end of the day, it's a determination of the judge, um, but it is often at the recommendation of the prosecutors or um, the arguments of the defense attorneys uh, representing their clients. So it's supposed to be um, in Missouri, we have new rules from the Missouri Supreme Court that is supposed to take into account the defendant's ability to pay um, and the rest of their circumstances when they are entering into the justice, into, into the justice system as to whether or not they should be held pretrial. Okay, so I didn't hear you say the Board of Aldermen has any purview within that. So we don't have any purview within that piece that the judges and the circuit attorneys get involved in, right? Not specifically in that piece, but some of the funding comes through the Board of Aldermen in the budget process, yes. Okay, all right. But your, your board bill specifically talks about how to manage that process, right? Well, the, the Division of Supportive Reentry um, includes funding for a couple of positions in order to better assist um, those. And this is actually um, sending some of it to the health department um, because we are looking at criminal justice through a, a health lens as well. And that is something that the board has been doing here um, over the last year or so. And so we're we are working on 
rehabilitation and case management, we're working on pretrial screening. And this includes um, line items for personal services for staff to be able to assist with that. Okay, talk to me a little bit more about hotels. Um, it's listed within the bill that has to do with um, detainee isolation process. Um, sure. I'd actually, if I could invite Noel to speak on that because he has um, done some work or looking at some other jurisdictions where that's been effective. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, and essentially, we are not requiring the corrections division to transfer detainees to hotels, um, but we are simply uh, inviting them to or requiring them to issue an RFP in allowing hotels to respond. And this is, again, based on other programs, for example, in New York, where they have found that hotels, which are largely vacant during the pandemic, can be excellent uh, places to quarantine individuals. Um, and this is, again, designed to uh, provide for a comprehensive uh, plan to have real proactive COVID measures in city jails. Now, now Noel, you've worked uh, for an, a mayor's administration before, right? That's right. And so you understand how administrations work, right? And do you think this is practical, legislating policy dictating to an administration of how they should govern themselves? I certainly agree that it's not ideal, and I would much rather uh, have the administration proactively uh, do these things. But, and you're right that there's a lot of policy embedded in here, uh, but the real core of it is the actual funding for positions and funding for services. And then the policy is layered on top uh, as directives. So you, you would agree basically then that, you know, this isn't good policy. This is not good legislating. We're, this it's is not ideal. practical. I just think it's not ideal. It's synonymous to not practical, right? No, I think this is the most practical way forward, given where we're. So, are. so, so, what we're doing is, if we don't like um, this, is a precedence that you're getting that, that all the women rights is starting to set up here at the Board of Aldermen. If we do not like a mayor or the mayor's administration, we at the Board of Aldermen will just start legislating how that mayor should govern themselves. Alderman hey. Boyd, I want to push back on that a little bit. We, we are right now working on a bill that appropriates money based on an ordinance that we passed that the mayor and the board of ENA also passed. And this bill itself does have to come through ENA before it can be signed into law. So we're not trying to go around folks. This is, this is part of working within our ordinance 71217 um, to walk alongside of it. Okay, good point. I, I disagree, I stand on what I said, but let me, let's go back to your point about ENA because you're absolutely right. This is going nowhere unless ENA approves it. So what I heard you say is you did not talk to President Reed, correct? Correct. Okay, you, have you talked to Mayor Cruson? Not directly, no. Okay. Have you talked to the Comptroller? I, I did try to reach out to her today. I did talk with her staff. Was her, was, her staff able to vouch for whether or not she supports this or not? No, not yet. I wasn't, um, I was trying to make sure that she understood what the committee substitute was that I was bringing forward today. Okay. Um, so no one from ENA has currently embraced this is what I hear, right? That's correct. Um, several members, I mean, the entire board of ENA did support ordinance 71217 um, and and endorsed a plan. Well, I guess that's not true. Um, I don't think Comptroller Green actually voted uh, voted yes on uh, Ordinance 71217, but um, she did ask that there be a plan in place. Um, and this is one of those steps towards that plan. So we are asking the Board of Aldermen to, to stand with what we, what we passed in 71217 and um, work within our authority to move this issue forward. And yes, ENA could squash this, um, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try. Okay. Um, a contingency plan, it's, I would think, would be very appropriate as we move through this process in supporting um, for Bill 92. I think it was that the Close the Workhouse Bill 92? Yes. Okay. Um, I would think a contingency plan, and I would think most of my colleagues, including myself, would would probably embrace that. If there's a contingency plan that people don't fall through the cracks, that we could be very supportive of that. But there is no contingency plan except um, what you're putting forth uh, as a reallocation ordinance 
Um, I, I, I want to be clear that when we present things, um, we're being fair. And what I heard Noel say early on was he talked about the length of stay somebody has been in a workhouse two years, five years. That has nothing to do with the Board of Alton. That is totally without our purview. So that has nothing to do with um, closing a workhouse, basically, because people in the Justice Center, I'm guessing, has probably been in the Justice Center for a year or two or three, maybe as well. So um, to, to, to talk about that, I, I don't think was really germane to, to this bill right here. And also, I want to say that, you know, Alderman, we're all human. And, and we all have a right to, to degree, disagree with um, each other. And I think when people make presentation at the Board of Aldermen, um, throwing harsh criticism at people does not help a cause. Uh, Noel, I'm disappointed in your presentation when you were harshly criticizing people involved in this process. That does not win people over. It alienates people. We can always talk about the facts and let the facts speak for themselves. And you're a very smart young man that I have a lot of admiration for, and I'm glad you're back in the city of St. Louis, but I just think there's a better way to communicate with the Board of Alderman. Thank you. I have no further questions, Mr. Chairman. All right, thank you, Mr. Boyd. At this point, we have, uh, if all woman Spencer is not available for REO, then we have gone through the full board and I will open up this part of the meeting to the public comment. Uh, we have a list of uh, now uh, 21 speakers since Noel is uh, listed as on the public speakers, but he's uh, taking his position as the council. So we will start with uh, speaker number one, Alicia Hernandez. Please state your name uh, and uh, proceed. We will allow three minutes uh, per person because we're going to have uh, quite a quite a few. So uh, if you have a stopwatch on your phone in front of you, try and time your comments accordingly and uh, we will proceed whenever you are ready, Ms. Hernandez. Um, thank you, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Perfect, uh, good afternoon committee members. Uh, thank you for allowing me to present testimony today. My name is Alicia Hernandez. I'm a resident of the 10th Ward. I am speaking today as a community member and on behalf of the American Civil Liberties Union of Missouri. I would like to express our strong support for defunding the workhouse in the city budget. It is time for the workhouse to close. As we've heard, Board Bill 167 reinvests 3.3 million from funding from the St. Louis Medium Security Institution, also known as the workhouse. Per the bill, this money would be invested in re-entry wraparound services and in the wards with the highest levels of poverty and crime. The ACLU Campaign for Smart Justice is working in all 50 states for reforms to usher in a new era of justice, which includes bail reform. We're fighting to overhaul harmful, unjust, and for-profit systems that needlessly lock people up who haven't even been convicted of a crime just because they can't afford to pay bail. In fact, many of the people in the workhouse have been held pretrial often because they are too poor to afford bail, and the system is too flooded to provide them with adequate representation. As we've heard, Action St. Louis, the Bail Project, and Arch City Defenders have led this fight for many years, along with strong community support. Organizations, including the ACLU of Missouri, have brought to light the abuses of the workhouse. This institution has been a persistent problem. Even in 2009, the ACLU of Missouri released a report on the critical conditions of the workhouse. And again, in 2012, the ACLU of Missouri called for an independent committee to provide oversight of the jail. Committee members, today I ask you to follow through on the ordinance unanimously passed last summer to close the workhouse, reinvest this money into our communities, and move us toward a system that is more equitable and effective. I ask you to vote yes on Board Bill 167. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, at that point, uh, and before I, we will, with so many speakers, I'm gonna take about five speakers, and I, I believe Paul Payne has a, a, some, a, a, some things we need to get to hear from, but I do want to get through uh, a few more of these. So uh, we'll go to Chelsea Murta. Are you ready, Chelsea? I am. All right. Uh, start whenever you like. I'll get the timer whenever you, I hear your first word. 
Thank you. My name is Chelsea Murda. I'm a resident of the 15th Ward, and I'm happy to be before you today to support Board Bill 167 with special recognition to prison abolitionist Dr. Angela Davis, who celebrates her birthday today. Since last summer, this board has made a lot of noise about closing the workhouse, and although we elected all of you to do a job, some of you have made it clear that you are not up to the task for which you have been chosen by voters. But this bill gives you an out. It gives you the opportunity to make good on the promises made to our city last summer and to the rhetoric that some aldermen now campaign on to be reelected. The board president even stated after board bill 92 was passed that it is not a symbolic gesture, but quote, as real as it gets, hollow empty words. At last week's hearing, we heard a lot of excuses for missing that December 31st closure deadline. Most frequently, we the voters heard from aldermen that Board Bill 92 did not specifically mandate that the workhouse be closed by that date. Sure, okay. Let us voters take you aldermen at your words. In, consider of they, in consideration of that then, none of you have disputed your intent to close the workhouse eventually. The deadline to do so, sure, but every single member of the board voted for a bill literally entitled closing the St. Louis City Medium Security Institution. And, and if that doesn't demonstrate your intent, I don't know what else would. Every day that the workhouse remains open is a day that this city continues to suffer from the brutalities of capitalism and MSI funds could be reallocated to serving the people of St. Louis directly, not subjecting them to organized state violence through mass incarceration. Instead, Board Bill 167 moves more than $3 million by April to the Division of Supportive Reentry, which is part of the Board Bill passed last summer, and to the Re-Envisioning Public Safety Trust Fund, which redirects funds for the city's highest need neighborhoods. That takes the step to address the root cause of crime and violence in St. Louis. We've added more police, we've added real-time cameras, and we're even trying to pass a spy plane that doesn't even work at night. And a lot of you have been on this board for a long time and you've been complacent with that crime and violence. But what you haven't done and what we haven't tried as a city is defunding racist institutions like the workhouse and putting those funds back into the community. Violence in black communities is deeply rooted in conditions that are beyond the direct control of the individuals who live there. But you have that control and you can start taking action now. Closing the workhouse is not the entire plan for criminal justice reform in St. Louis. We know that, but it's a starting point, which is more than what we have now. 10 seconds, 10 seconds. The more, the more difficult question for the board will be whether its members have what it takes to end the politics of white supremacy and to reimagine a better St. Louis. If you stand by your yes okay, vote- Okay, your time is up, ma'am. Your time is up. We're, we're on a tight schedule. I apologize, but your time Thank is you. up. Thank you. And what we'll do, Paul, I know you're with us. We're going to- take this in uh, the 21 speakers when we have to speaker number seven uh, Ms. Shepard you will be uh, uh, you will be up after that so if you want to prepare yourself uh, we will now move to Inez Bordeaux did I get that correct I hope Inez? yes, yes uh, I'm sorry sometimes I have a really hard time getting myself off of mute um uh, thank you very much um, for allowing public testimony today, um, Chairman. I, my name is Inez Bordeaux. I am an organizer with the Close to Workhouse campaign. I'm also manager of community collaborations um, at Arch City Defenders. And I am here today because I am an impacted person. I'm a person that has actually been inside of the workhouse, not visited the workhouse, actually been detained inside of that jail for 30 consecutive days. So I know firsthand what's going on inside of that building. Um, and I came here today to say the closed workhouse campaign didn't start because it was a catchy slogan or because the original four black led organizations that make up the campaign decided on its own to do this. It started because they listened to the people um, that were coming outside of that jail. And that includes people like me, real people who have been detained inside of the jail, people that have been failed by the very systems that are meant to support and uplift them are instead being locked away inside of a facility not fit for human habitation. 
I am the person that you're talking about when you debate closing this jail. I committed a crime back in 2009, a crime of poverty and desperation to not have to go back to the man who picked up a hot skillet off of a stove and burned me all over my body with it. And instead of being given support and resources, I was thrown in the criminal legal system where I temporarily lost my nursing license, which was my source of income. I had to send my kids away. I spent three years homeless. In total, I lost seven years of my life because of lack of resources. And that's what this campaign is about. It's about interrupting that cycle closing a jail and using those funds to make sure that people have the support they need, whatever that may be. That is how we reduce crime and violence. Um, and I also want to note um, that there are elders on this call who have said they've spoken to people inside of the workhouse. And I wanna let those elders know that every single day, my job is to speak to people that are being detained inside of the workhouse and inside of CJC. And not a single person that I have spoken to or any of the staff at Arch City Defenders has spoken to has said, we want to stay in the workhouse. We don't want to be moved to CJC. No one has said that. And I know because we've spoken to 60 people in the last week and a half, people that are currently detained inside of the workhouse. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. All right. We will move to Julia Cushing. Julia Cushing, are you with us? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please proceed Sorry, when you're ready. I'm, yeah, I am in the car, so I apologize. Um, I'm no, please here. Please be careful. Yes, I will be, <laughs> I promise. Um, I'm here just to uh, also add my support for this bill. Um, I'm a city resident. I'm a mental health provider um, out in the community. I um, could not put it better than Inez can. Um, she is the person that, one of the very people that got me interested in this campaign. Um, I got interested in the campaign to close the workhouse after listening to people who've been impacted by the workhouse. I cannot imagine what those people have gone through. Um, I never will be able to relate to it, but I believe their stories. I believe people's pain. That's what I do for a living. I am a therapist and I talk to people all day long about their trauma. Um, trauma comes up in all kinds of ways, lying, stealing, violence. Those are all symptoms of trauma. And I know that people have talked a lot about the concerns about violence and crime in our city. And I am absolutely one of those people that is concerned about that. And that is why I support re-envisioning public safety in a way that actually gets at the root causes of why people commit crimes, why people become violent. Um, and the arrest and incarcerate model has shown us that it does not get to that root cause. That's why I'm in support of this bill and in support of just in more in general, re-envisioning how we deal with crime and violence in our city because the way that we're doing it now, um, it, it's not fixing the problem. And the city residents deserve legislation, policy, um, and leaders who are willing to work towards addressing those root causes. And this bill is um, just one of the many steps that we will take towards that. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. And thank you for being succinct. Okay, we move on to Amelia Hinckley. Hinckley, or Ms. Hinckley, are you with us? Can you hear me? We can. Whenever you're ready, we'll start the clock with your first words. Perfect. My name is Amelia Hinckley and I'm a resident of the 15th Ward speaking in support of Ward Bill 167. First, I would like to address the trust that you all have broken with the people of St. Louis. Last year, every single one of you voted to close the workhouse. And instead of spending 2020 pushing the departments involved to do their jobs and follow the letter of the law, you all sat on your hands and did nothing. You showed the entire city that we cannot trust your word or your votes. And that lack of trust and dishonesty will be remembered every time each one of you seeks re-election, which for some of you is not too far in the future. Second, I would like to point out uh, the definition of insanity, which I have to keep doing to the Board of Aldermen, uh, which is doing the same thing twice and expecting different results. For all of our lifetimes, we have been using the incarceration model. And as you all like to point out, crime isn't getting any better. 
We have had two jails and a bloated police department budget for a long time and nothing is getting better. Under your watches, nothing is getting better. You all keep asking for a plan, but I don't see a plan that any of you have put forward that has made anything better for our lives here in St. Louis. And so by funding things like the Div Division of Supportive Reentry, we will actually provide the support to make some people, make sure people do not go back to places like the CJC. And the people of this city are already doing things to actually support our communities and decrease crime by creating things like the Tap-In Justice Center and the St. Louis Reentry Fund. So what I'm asking you is to try something new, to try something that might actually work, because so far I haven't seen you do anything that actually will work. And folks keep talking so much about hearing directly from people in the, in the prison system. And one thing I would like to point out is that there are 17 voices we will not be hearing from today. And those are the 17 people that have died in the custody of either the workhouse or the CJC in the past 10 years. And so I hear Alderwoman Hubbard talk about how things have gotten a lot better. I don't think 17 deaths in the hand of our prison system is better at all. Um, and so I think that we should take into consideration those voices that will never be heard because of the brutality of this system. Um, and I would also just like to say that I know that so many of the alders, including Alderman Oldenburg, like just call us all activists, but um, I am a taxpaying, voting, publicly contributing citizen of this society. And I'm sorry that my opinion does not match with what you would like to hear, but we are citizens of this city. We are invested in making this city better. And so if you have a narrative that you would like to push, just say that, but do not deride our voices and the concerns that we have in asking for the closure of this workhouse by writing us off because we are just as much citizens of this society. So please listen to our voices, listen to the 20 plus people that are here that have been speaking out to all the detainees that have spoken in saying they want the workhouse closed and do not just write us off because we do not respond to the narratives that you are pushing. Pass board bill 167, thank you. All right, thank you very much and under time. All right, uh, John Chasnoff, speaker number six, John. Hi, hello to all of you. Thank you for letting me speak today. Uh, I did want to respond. Please to state your name, sir. You have to do a, you state your own name first. Oh, I'm sorry, John, I'm John Chasnoff. Um, and I wanted to respond to an earlier comment. Um, I am not paid uh, to do the work that I do. I know I appear before you all frequently and I'm known for having opinions, um, but um, they're unpaid, unsolicited. They come from the heart. Um, they come from my commitment to causes. And, um, and I want to speak today on, you know, from that point of view. I know some of the folks on this call are paid, but I know that they speak with the same passion and commitment and, and honesty uh, that I try to, uh, to bring to the table. And I think that um, you know the elders are paid, and I don't have any question that they're committed to their point of view and honest and sincere in their point of view as well. Um, I know that I've been butting heads with some of you more frequently now than I used to in the past, and I want to say that um, I hope that we can find issues where we can come together um, and and work together for the betterment of the community. Um, on this particular bill. One of the things that I noticed was that um, had the workhouse closed in December, we would have had $500,000 more at, at our disposal than we have now. So the clock is ticking, that money is being spent, and we don't have the money to put into our community that we would have had had we done this in a timely manner. So um, that is money that could have gone to rental services, could have gone for more ward capital, could have gone for the intentional um, encampment for the unhoused, which is needed this winter right now. Um, and so I hope that we can resolve this, um, you know, impasse that we seem to have come to and find a way to get the workhouse closed. Um, I do wish that Dale Glass, uh, Commissioner Glass, had put out a serious RFP to find out, you know, what beds are available in our community, uh, alternative um, housing for inmates. Um, but that hasn't happened yet, and this bill would make that happen. Um, I do wish that we were doing more COVID testing to provide better safety for the inmates in the, uh, in, in the criminal justice system, but that hasn't happened yet, and this bill would make that happen. Um, so um, I think that this bill is a serious attempt to put forward a plan, uh, a practical plan, to make um, this doable and make it possible. Um, I do think that we all do want to get to that place. 
Um, and um, if you all, as older persons, see deficits in this plan, rather than just shoot it down, I hope that you all will lay out your concerns, uh, work with Close the Workhouse, work, work with the sponsor Ten seconds. to um, actually make it a better plan if it needs to be and get this done for our community. Thanks. All right. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, the next speaker, speaker number seven, Jay Shepard. And after that, we'll take a break for Mr. Payne to interject uh, before we continue with public input. So Jay Shepard, are you with us? Yes. Hello, my name is Jay Shepard. My pronouns are they, them, theirs. I am an organizer with Action St. Louis and a resident of the 25th Ward. And I'm here today asking you all to support Board Bill 167. Um, Board Bill 167 was closed with Jail, whom you all voted on closing back in July and invest those funds into addressing the root causes of crime and violence. When our elected officials choose to keep funding the workhouse, they are choosing to waste funding that could be used for community resources that actually mitigate harm. Board Bill 167 will defund the workhouse by April 1st and transfer 3.1 million to some of the following areas that Nawal pointed out that I wanna highlight and talk about the money more. Around $750 for the City Justice Center to help with the transition of closing the workhouse as well as helping provide resources to better manage COVID. There was a recent outbreak of COVID-19 in our city jails and the way that should have been dealt with is by providing people with adequate PPE, providing more testing and medical care. This bill would fund how we care for the people for people um, right now during this global pandemic and not use the workhouse as a scapegoat for not taking adequate uh, COVID-19 precautions. Board Bill 167 allocates around 800,000 for the Division of Supportive Reentry, which provides rehabilitation and case management funding for programs like uh, for people on parole or probation, helping guide them through the legal process, connecting folks with education, employment, supportive networks, health, mental health care, skilled practitioners, um, stable housing. It allocates 1.6 million to the revision of public safety trust fund, which is a special fund that provides anti-poverty resources to neighborhoods disproportionately affected by violent crime and about 1.1 million to war capital for wards with the highest uh, need neighborhoods. And these are many of your wards, the first ward, the second ward, the third ward, the fifth ward, the 13th, 14th, 18th, 20th, 21st, 22nd, 25th, and 27th. We've all suffered from decades of divestment. Imagine what your wards could do with this funding. This bill is a step-by-step -step plan and a means to closing the workhouse and provides direct investment into communities plagued by the city's racist policies of redlining and criminalization. This bill also contains budget directives for next year that would ensure that money previously allocated for the workhouse will go towards the community. I challenge you all to really listen to the folks speaking today. 10 seconds. And listen to the community who has overwhelmingly cried out for the closure of the workhouse and investment into resources. Thank you for your time. All right, thank you very much, Shepard. All right, Paul Payne, are you with us, sir? Paul? Yes, I am. Okay, thank you, Mr. Director, for joining us today. Uh, thank you for, I, I just, with so many speakers, I wanted to get a few in first. Uh, and, uh, We'll go back to our regular scheduled programming, but uh, if you have any questions or comments, then I, I might open it up to questions from the committee members, if that's all right with you, sir. Sure. I, I, got, I do have some, uh, some comments. Um, first of all, I, as, you, as you may recall, some members of the Public Safety Committee, I presented the memo that I uh, compiled back at the end of September as a result of the Ordinance 71217, taking a look at the potential fiscal impact of closing MSI. Um, and there were three scenarios presented on there. Um, the first, I, I, and it's important to first, it was to establish what the base is, what, where, where operations stand as they are due today with both facilities open. And then the second, looking at what happens if uh, MSI closes on, on December 31st, and then projecting, uh, doing an initial projection for F of the following fiscal year. And, and so at the conclusion of that, 
basically was that M uh, MSI is pretty much uh, spending close to budget. Correct. Uh, CJC was spending about 2.9 million other under budget. So uh, overall, it was close to 3 million combined, combined uh, under spending. And, and that's with current operations. Then you switch and say, okay, what if we close MSI? Uh, and, and this is an important point, And I, I want to make sure that everyone understands this. You're, you're, you're not talking about savings. You're shifting the cost from MSI to the Justice Center. Um, that is not savings. I, I mean, you can, you can say it's a shift and that, that's accurate, but to say that you're saving that money is not because you're not spending it today. If you're not spending it today, but then you ask CJC to pick up the cost from MSI, then you are spending it. So that's not, uh, to say that you're funding that, that's not savings. Um, there are a number of things that uh, I noticed, and I'm not going to get into too much detail in, in terms of the um, assumptions. I mean, BPS gave me some memo that said that it would cost a couple hundred thousand dollars to assess the facility. And I, I noticed that in, in this presentation, it has a hundred thousand. Um, there are also another few things that I've discovered since uh, the uh, first quarter. Uh, for instance, in, in discussing next year's budget, uh, I know with the circuit courts have been spending about $30,000 a month on electronic bracelets as a means for keeping the population, the facilities down. Well, and, and I, when I heard that, I'm, I was sort of surprised because I, I, I wasn't aware of that being in the budget. And I'm told that through grants and COVID funding, that's how that's been funded. But looking ahead, uh, we're going to have to budget for that. So that's another $360,000 uh, that we're talking about uh, per year. Um, and then also, in just looking at the bill itself and, and just the restatement of some of the costs, one of the important things I always include in, in, in the uh, presentation of costs, particularly when you're talking about a supplemental appropriation, is not only the expense side, but the revenue side. And in the, my first quarter report, the revenue side, uh, it wasn't really that much data there for me to assess that. But it, it, if you've looked at my uh, second quarter report year to date, we're actually falling short in, in the revised estimates of revenue. So, so uh, uh, CJC may be underspending by uh, 2.9 million or such, but then on the revenue side and general fund, uh, we've got shortfalls both in the per diem and the federal housing prisoner uh, reimbursements of about 800,000 right now through the first fiscal half. And that's only on the general fund side. So, uh, and again, on the special fund side, it's, uh, it could be as much as another million two or so. So in total, you're looking at maybe a two million, one and a half to $2 million shortfall on the revenue side. So you got to keep, keep that in mind. And, and so, and then finally in the bill specifically, uh, something, there's one item in there that is specifically uh, problematic, and I'm not the lawyer, so I'll, I'll just offer my uh, two cents as just sort of experience having gone through this over the years, is that this provision where it tries to preempt the Commissioner of Corrections requesting anything regarding MSI in a budget, in the future budget, and that's like FY22 and beyond. I'm thinking you're... you're one, you don't have FY22 as a bill before you, so I, I think that's sort of an issue. But I, I just from a, a standpoint of the budget process, that seems to be circumventing what the charter provides in terms of what your, how that works in terms of the board of a recommending and you reducing. I, I, I was thinking about it as sort of, let's say it's a scenario where someone doesn't like stop signs. And so you try to tell the street director, oh, he can't request uh, money for stop signs in next year's budget and trying to legislate that. Well, the proper method for that is that if they do, and it's in the budget before you, then you opt to reduce it. But to preemptively try to pass legislation, I think you're going around the charter provisions in terms of the how that's supposed to lay out when you're going through the budget. And so I, I think that's an issue as well. Um, anyway, those are my thoughts. But again, I, I do want to emphasize that when you're talking about reducing MSI and that's uh, in the MSI facility and that, that make, there's a lot of discussion going on with that. But when you're talking about savings, you're not, this does not present savings. Basically you're shifting the cost over and then taking that app, uh, uh, appropriation and trying to spend it on something else, but that's not savings. Uh, so I, I really wanna emphasize that because there's that one provision in there in the bill, which tries to say basically this whole 7.8 million, whatever the balance of that can be spent elsewhere. Well, that that ignores the fact that you are spending some of that money at 
that you weren't spending at CJC, not, and that doesn't even take into account the loss, uh, the, the revenue adjustment that we have to make and keep in mind of. So those were some of my thoughts. Um, I, again, I'm I, 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 I thankful for the, uh, the ability to speak nope. today and I'll, I'll be available for any questions. Well, I appreciate it, Mr. Director. What I will do is go through the committee very uh, uh, one by one by seniority. Uh, Alderman uh, Davis, Madam Vice, any questions of the director? Uh, director uh, Payne, I would like to ask you, uh, because again, I've served on not just this Ways and Means uh, Committee, but in other situations as well. In regulatory process, we can't we can't pass legislation that absolutely prohibits any service to our community before the need is presented to us. So if there's a need presented, we have to evaluate and put it in a current budget. But preempting any opportunity to evaluate. Uh, I, I don't understand that process. Yeah, and I, that's the, one of the issues I, I sort of mentioned is that, yeah, I, I don't think you can actually. Uh, again, I'm not the, the legal, uh, the legal uh, a lawyer, but yeah, I, I just from the process, the way we budget is that there is a, uh, the board of ENA uh, recommends and submits a budget to the Board of Aldermen and then you have the ability to reduce. And then if you wanna increase, you go back to the Board of ENA to do that. And there's that process that's specified in charter to preemptively try to legislate something that the director can request or cannot request something seems to be going around that provision. I, I would think that would be legally suspect. And I just wanna share uh, that I still haven't heard anything. And I mentioned this before, that um, the city of St. Louis does not have the absolute right to close the workhouse. And nobody listened before, but I definitely wanted to see a plan put in place on how we could reduce the population and or close and repurpose the building. So once the plan is done, and I trust Mr. Glass because he's been through this process before, he knows what the regulatory agencies will accept. And if that plan is not approved by the agencies that protect the inmates, uh, then we have to go back to square one uh, because we don't have the legal right to just open the door and let people out uh, and, and or just send them somewhere else. The plan has to be approved. Uh, so somewhere in all of this, there are a number of things that we've just missed and or because we're not professionals, uh, we just want to have our will. Uh, we need to go back and evaluate. Uh, but I'm, I'm OK now. I, you had the same thought that I had, but I didn't want to say it until I heard from you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Madam Vice. Alderman Picaro, any questions of Director Payne? No, I really don't. All right. Thank you very much. Alderman Howard is not here. Uh, Alderman Hubbard, any questions of the Director? No questions at this time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Alderman Murphy. No, I have no questions. I understood what he said. I have no questions at this time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Alderwoman uh, Spencer, have you joined us with audio or no? Okay. Uh, we will go to uh, Alderman Muhammad. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Director, for being here. Uh, and I was just listening to what you said, just going over some numbers, looking at our budget. Um, can you go over? Can you go a little bit more in depth of of the uh, of the workhouse budget and a CJC budget for me? Uh, just trying to understand a little bit more as it relates to potentially closing uh, the workhouse and how it could affect both budgets and where we want to see an increase or where we would see an increase. Can you just go over a little bit more in depth for me again, just for transparency, please? Sure, sure. And again, I'll, I'll refer to the, uh, my original uh, memo, which had the three uh, scenarios attached, uh, showing what uh, projections based on those three scenarios. So the first one, 
And again, this was the one where it says, uh, again, this is as of the date was uh, at the end of September and it was it said current operations, both facilities. Okay. Uh, do you see where I'm referencing? Yes, sir, I do. I do. I do. Okay. Thank you. So uh, you have the MSI budget, Department 632, um, and, and it was projecting based on the through the first quarter what it was based. Now, the budget was $8.2 million. That also includes some utility costs from the Board of Public Service uh, that they pay. Uh, that, well, that's the major source of, uh, of costs that wouldn't be included in uh, uh, M MSI. Uh, based on that, and we were projecting expenditures of about 7.9 million through the first quarter. That would mean they're, they would be currently underspending by about 250,000 or so. And again, based on the first quarter. With the Justice Center, uh, you had a total budget of 21 point, uh, or 21.6 million. And there's actually uh, 22.5 million if you throw in the utilities, which is a, a, almost, a, it's 965,000. Again, that's an estimated utility cost from BPS. Mm -hmm. Um, now, in addition to that, we had that special fund, which is funded primarily through the, uh, the federal housing per diem reimbursements uh, that are offsetting some of their costs as well. And that was $5.5 million. So their total budget was $28 million. Now, projected through the first quarter was about $25.3 million. So they're projecting underspending at 2.7. So those two combined, and you can see the, in the, in the total correction combined was about $3 million under budget project. Okay, so that's status quo um, uh, with both facilities operating through the first quarter. Now, I'm below those expenditures, I did, I did have an illustration there, and I, I referenced that in my earlier comments about what the revenue estimates were on reimbursements. So in the general mm -hmm. fund, we've got the $3 million that was estimated in prisoner, that's from the state, as well as the 30% of the federal reimbursements of 2.3, which 5.3. And then the special fund gets 70% of the uh, federal reimbursements. So that would have been 5.4. And we're falling short of that right now, but I, I, I'll hold off on that for now. So the That's second right. scenario mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. assumes MSI's closure at the end of December. So this, is, this was saying, looking at forward, if MSI closed, what would have occurred? So it, uh, under, under 632 Department of MSI, it was projecting uh, additional expenditures for the balance of that second quarter of the year, which, was, uh, which would bring total projections of the $8.2 million budget to 4.6, uh, and which means you've got $3.6 million unspent there. Mm -hmm. Now, going to Justice Center, uh, the Justice Center would, beginning to, would begin not only to project forward with its costs, but assume some of the costs associated with the moving of, uh, of uh, staffing, as well as uh, any projected like outstate housing and things like that, that, that the Justice Center would have to pick up as a result of the closing of MSI. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. it would be projected under that scenario to be $800,000 over budget based on that. So, and again, you can argue uh, so in total, it was about 2.7 million under budget, which is about 300,000 higher than the original scenario. You can argue, uh -huh. say, oh, we don't need all that staff. And again, I, the corrections commissioner presented that. And I, as I mentioned back last fall, typically when we get a request from a director like that, we'll run it through the vetting machine and we'll run it through the uh, vetting and, and see how much secure, but I'm not prepared at, a point, at this point just to dismiss it all. I mean, you, you just have to go through the budget process and let, let them uh, um, present whatever it is that they say they need. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And this also assumes some amount for outstate housing. Absolutely. Now the subsequent year, yeah. this was like a, a, a snapshot yeah. looking ahead to FY22, uh -huh. you would have department 632, uh, basically uh, with only 300,000, that, that was estimated utility costs because you have to keep the, the, the place from freezing and all that kind of stuff, as well as uh, decommissioned maintenance costs. These were estimates provided by the Board of Public Service. So you'd have some de minimis costs there associated with keeping the facility open, uh, it just uh, so it doesn't start falling apart. Um, and, and then you would also have, then a combined, it would all be under the Justice Center, uh, a combined uh, total of, of funds for about $30 million uh, well, $28.9 million in general fund, another 5.5, assuming that still holds up, which, which looks like it's not going to in the special fund, for a $34.5 million total budget. 
Mm-hmm. But, and so that's an increase, in, uh, again, uh, of about $920,000 uh, uh, over, over and above uh, that budget amount. But in comparing the FY22 budget with the FY, the projected 22 budget with the FY uh, 20, uh, 21 actual expenditures, you're about a million and a half lower. So that, and now, again, if you can argue, if you look at that line on the combined supplemental staffing, that's a million three. You could say, oh, well, they don't need any of that, and we'll just take all that out. Well, again, you're, you got to go through the vetting process on that. How much is that? You can't just discard that. You'd have to go through it. But even if you did, you'd still be about $3 million under uh, compared to the FY21 budget, which I, it's not a, it's, it's not a, it's basically comparable to what you'd be spending today, not some big $8 million reduction in, in expenditures. And so, and that's even without, even if you zero that out, you'd still be there. Now it does have about $920,000 allocated for outstate housing. I think I, I had that as just assuming 50 per day are out there that you can give or take on that, but you still have to keep, keep that in consideration. Now, the other, as I mentioned in my presentation, uh, um, there's two other things, uh, the, the, the uh, electronic bracelets, uh, which I, I mentioned, but it, are not anywhere in these numbers. And that's about $360,000, which is, I'm told the courts are going to include in their budget request. And then the revenues estimated. And now the revenues are been declining now uh, through the first half. And I'm told that uh, we may be as much as 800,000 short. So that's so you may be having spending less in uh, the uh, CJC, but then you're also falling short on the revenue side. So when you're when you're talking supplemental appropriations, the current fiscal year, you have to take both of those sides in, into account. But the bottom line there is that there is this isn't creating some. I mean, you are eliminating MSI as a cost center in that scenario but you're not creating some big savings somewhere. The costs have to show up somewhere and, and they're showing up both in, mostly in the, in the justice center and it's increased cost. Um, and where that falls, uh, particularly with the revenue situation, I, I'm not sure, but, um, but you got to take all of that into account. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, uh, Mr. Director. And one more question. Um, and we, in regards to the jobs at MSI, uh, because we really haven't discussed that. Into um, a what? Excuse me? In, in regards to the jobs, the employment at MSI, how would this affect the jobs and employment at MSI? Uh, oh. Will we be transferring uh, jobs? Because okay, the board bill would, really doesn't address it. Sure, sure. This was this assumes, for all intents and that all the individuals that would be at MSI gets shifted over to, uh, to the Justice Center. That's mm-hmm. what that assumes. Mm-hmm. Because they're, most of them, if you look at them, most of them are our correctional people. Now, I didn't go through any detail, and I'll leave that to others, like Corrections and Department of Personnel, whether they fit by job definition where they would go. But I, I can't believe that most of them are correctional facility type positions. So I can't envision them ending up anywhere other than corrections facilities. So uh, again, I, that's I, I, there was no analysis regarding how those are classified, but that's the assumption in this presentation. Absolutely. Uh, no further questions, Mr. Director. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Right. Chairman. Thank you, Alderman Muhammad. We'll move to uh, Alderman Olderberg. Any questions of the director? No questions. All right. Thank you, sir. Alderman Pam Boyd. Any questions of the director? Uh, no questions. Uh, thank you, uh, Director Payne. You kind of brought a lot of clarity on what we had been saying. So thank you very much uh, for your presentation. All right. All the Clark Hubbard. No questions. Thank you. All right. Uh, all the one Rice has expressed a desire to uh, respond to some comments. Uh, I will yield my time to her. Feel free, All the Rice, to uh, direct your comments towards Mr. Payne or Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Bulmer. Um, and thank you, uh, Budget Director, for being here today. I, I appreciate it. I know it um, uh, is always fun to hop on a on a Board of Aldermen meeting here in the afternoon. Um, I did just want to want to clarify. So Ordinance 71217 did make a direction for future years. Um, so we have the re-envisioning public safety fund did say um, that this fund sh- shall be allocated annually 
And in subsequent years, the $16 million historically allocated for MSI operations, less the cost of housing detainees and, and further costs um, shall be deposited into this. So do you, would you agree that that covers sort of the future year's directives at least? Because I know that, well, so, and to clarify, the Board of ENA can adjust any of this. Um, these are non-binding because ENA has the final say at the end of the day, um, but this was set out in, in our previous ordinance. Yeah, yeah, and I understand that, and, that, and yeah, that's absolutely was established there. But I, but I think, and and you're getting into some difficult territory where you're trying to pass a piece of legislation that allocates funds in a future budget, uh, and and you, I think I don't think that would stand up. I, you, you've got let me let me let me back up, and sometimes you have revenues that are allocated by statute. Let's say a uh, half cent sales tax, they have to be used for this purpose and what, what have you. And that's, and, th and that's fine. So that you, you, as long as you're uh, maintaining your statutory obligations regarding to that, uh, it's subject. But when you start talking about general revenues and then you say, A, it has to be spent on X, I, I think you're gonna have issues with how uh, that going in, in conflict with the basic premise of how the budget's adopted each year and how it's deliberated each year. And I think you're gonna have a problem with that. I, again, I'm not the lawyer, so, uh, but, I, but I just, just my experience on that. Sure, I, I, I understand that. And I think that the bill, the bill is attempting to, to make those directions. And again, the bill, the bill itself just has to come through ENA before it would be signed into law. And so I, the idea here is that we're we're trying to set out these sorts of parameters um, for what for what we as the Board of Aldermen and the city, as ENA would weigh in, um, does have a direction that we want these funds to go. Again, um, that, that as well as what came through in the previous ordinance would be subject to future um, budget project projections as well as you know realities of, of where that budget is in the coming year. So um, I, I would agree with that um, to a certain extent, but also that, you know, that I think I think we can we can state that we have priorities, um, even if they're non-binding at this point. Um, the other the other question I had, I, I think you and I kind of spoke about this a little bit earlier, but so are we are we would you be able to project at this point if we were to close the workhouse by April first? Would corrections have that three point three million dollars surplus um, relative to the budget, assuming no additional costs, or is that something? They were not well, sure. I mean, aside just from the expenditures, I mean, through the through the uh, through the second quarter, as I mentioned, the expenditure projection wasn't really that much different. It's the right. I, I think it was three million or so in, at, at the uh, first quarter and two point nine the second quarter and all. I think the difference you you got just just again, this is strictly looking at the budget and projecting there. You've got some revenue shortfalls on the correction side. Now, again, it's all general revenue. Uh, Right, and, and so you're looking in total. But if you were just focusing on corrections, you got the potential of a two million dollar shortfall on the revenue side. So uh, there are, there, to, I, I, I guess, to say that you you have generated, you're not generating savings to to address that if you've got if you only if you basically spend money that you otherwise wouldn't be spending, and then and then ignore the revenue side of that equation. Sure. Okay. Um, and then if, I mean, if this were, so just based on what is in the bill right now, um, if this were to go through, um, could we balance the budget for the rest of this fiscal year based on what's in this bill? Well, <laughs> that's, a, that's a pretty loaded question. I, I, uh, for those that, actually looked at the, the second quarter report. I mean, basically, as you know, we were going through quite a year this year. I, we basically, the economy shut down and we, had, we hadn't experienced that before and we had to take some pretty drastic steps to get this budget balanced. And that, some of those drastic steps included uh, revenue estimates that say, hey, what happens when, you know, what, when the economy shuts down, what do you do? So uh, if it, through the fiscal first half, I, I can say that uh, the expended, the revenues are all bad. I mean, they were bad. Now, if there's any bright side to that is we expected to see those revenues drop significantly. 
and some of them are doing a little better. I, I think earnings and payroll uh, were doing better than estimate. Sales tax, that's down over 20%. Right. I, we've never seen that before. That, that's significant. I, I, I can't overestimate how bad that is. Now, having said that, we did estimate that, close to that. And so we're sort of knock on wood, hoping that we're in a position to weather this storm. Right now through the first half, I did see a small shortfall in some of the revenues we didn't uh, anticipate taking a dive, like city court revenues, EMS revenues down over 20% uh, um, uh, and some of those type of things. Uh, and, and we were sort of coming in light. Now, what happens with earnings and payroll tax to the fiscal, rest of the fiscal year may determine where we end up. But to do a supplemental appropriation in the middle of that and say we'll be okay, I, I can't. Uh, yeah, I, I can't. I can't say that. Particularly with when we're relying on underspending, it, it, it requires underspending if revenues fall short. I mean, there's no other way of doing that. Some of these revenues you're not going to know until the fourth quarter. Corporate returns don't even come into the fourth quarter. The GBL doesn't come into the fourth quarter. Mm -hmm. So your only ability to respond to those type of things is to underspend. Okay. And that's what correction, regardless of what happened to MSI, they were on that track. Okay. But now of course they need to be on that track simply because their, their revenues are also hit too. Okay. So, I mean, I, it's, it would be difficult to assess that uh, sitting here today. Okay, I, I very much appreciate it. Thank you so much for being available today and for answering questions. Thanks. Yes, sure. All right, that concludes your uh... Response, all, all, all the one, all right? Yes, I'm good, thank okay. you. Okay, all right. Uh, and I see no one else has questions. Uh, Mr. Director, you're welcome to hang around if you like, but if you have uh, more pressing issues, we will understand. We're okay. going to go back to uh, public comment. Thank you all, thank you, Mr. Chair. No, thank, uh, we appreciate your time. We know what uh, you're having, the worst year of your life here, <laughs> probably in your long, long history down there. So it's like uh, pulling rabbits out of a hat, I understand. All Appreciate right. it, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all. My pleasure, my pleasure, Mr. Director. Mr. Chairman, all right. I have a question. Who's, who's speaking? Hello? Who was that? Mr. Chairman, this is Alderman Boyd. Oh, May I ask a okay. question to Paul Payne? Boyd, yes. please, please proceed, Alderman Boyd. Thank you. Alderman, uh, Mr. Director, still with us. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Paul? Paul? Yes. Uh, I just want to be clear, and there was a lot of things that were said. Uh, this bill, are you of the opinion that it's a supplemental appropriation? It, that's, uh, that's uh, yeah, it, it, I would say it's unusual in that your, your supplemental appropriation usually is when you have additional money to allocate to a certain thing. Um, whether you call it a supplemental when you're moving money uh -huh. uh, from one place to another, I, I, yeah, I don't know whether that follows the definition of supplemental. I, I, I'll defer to the, the legal the city council on that one. But yeah, basically what okay. you're proposing right. is to move money from one point to another. Right. Yeah, sounds like reallocation. Okay, I just want, and by the way, while I was on this call, I decided I am currently at MSI because I want to see for myself or hear for myself what's going on at MSI. So I want to just let you guys know that while we're on this call, I decided to run across. Now, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Alderman Bard, our Reverend reporter today. Thank you. All right. Uh, once again, Paul, thank you for your time. And uh, if, if you, you're you welcome to leave, everyone has gotten everything they want out of you today. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, sir. Thank you. All right. We will now move back to our public input. And uh, speaker number eight is Tara Wayne. Tara, are you still with us through this wonderful day? Tara? How you doing? You? There you go. You will have three minutes. Uh, if you have a stopwatch, please start it so we can keep everybody uh, moving today. And uh, mention, state your name and then you can start. How you doing? My name is Tara Wayne and I'm a, I live in a, a Ward 6. And I'm on here just to let everybody know what's going on. I support the bill. Um, a relative of mine had been in, was in the Justice Center for two, almost two years, so one and a half years. and he, they, they, he has gotten in trouble any time until recently when the inmate started acting up because they was upset about what was going on because they was mixing people that had COVID with people who didn't have COVID. So that was the reason why the incident happened where it's at now. And 
my significant other got moved to the workhouse. As he'd be at the workhouse, he got to an altercation with a police officer. The police officer had maced him first, and he was bragging about it to everybody. So then at the open the door, that's when they got to the altercation. They threw a mace bomb under the door and left him in there. He already um, had previous medical conditions, like he had uh, seizures and he has a cyst on his brain. They left him like that for an hour before he allowed him to wash his cell. Then they took him out of his cell, took him downstairs for processing and put him in the cell. He took all his clothes and only gave him a smock. This happened on July 4th. No, sorry, January 4th. January 4th. And the cell he was in had sewer problems. So every time the flush the toilet that the sewer would come up, the beam and everything, the COs was aware of what happened and they refused to move him or anything. He was like that for a week and a half. I called down there every day, January from January the 5th until now. No one gave me information. I called the lieutenant, lieutenant, every time I called, I called the caseworker. The caseworker said he cannot give me information pertaining to him. The caseworker told me to call Superintendent Carson. I called the superintendent. His secretary said she refused to transfer me to him. She said that he is not taking any calls, that I don't know what's going on down there because I'm not there. I have so many inmates calling me, telling me what's going on. They had cut the water off on them for hours. They had BM in their toilets. They couldn't wash their hands. They only get 30 minutes of rec one day. Some of them inmates don't even eat. I'm sorry. Some of them inmates don't even eat state trade, so they can't even cook their food. He still don't have clothes on right now to this day in this 20 some days later, he, the lieutenant said she's gonna go to answer the justice center and have a meeting about him. She, so he asked us to speak to the lieutenant because he been trying to get his stuff back. When they put him back in the cell, he took all his legal papers, they took all his food, all his hygiene, took everything from him. So he was asking for the lieutenant. So when he's asked for the lieutenant, two people came on. The man maced him and closed the door on him, left him like that for 20 minutes. Inmates calling me, let me know what's going on. Also, another time since the incident, he asked two officers for some tissue at three o'clock. At the clock, he called me and let me know that they still haven't got any tissue. When I called the complaint line, the lady, I told her what was going on and everything. 10 seconds. I told her what was going on. She went and checked on him. She came, he told her everything that was going on, all the bad stuff. She told him she was not going to tell him the bad stuff. No, he's telling me the good stuff. She came back and told me he was all right. And I still haven't talked to anybody, nobody he still told me nothing. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Okay. Speaker number nine, Emily Anderson. Emily, you're still with us? Um, hi, yes, I'm here. Thank you. Um, okay, state your, state your name, please, and then we can start. Sure, my name is Emily Anderson. Um, thank you for letting me speak before you today. Um, there is an issue of crime and violence in St. Louis, but those issues were created through a lack of policy to address poverty. Poverty is a policy issue and each day that the Board of Aldermen fails to rise to the challenge of addressing it in a real meaningful way is another day that someone in this city is going to make a choice out of desperation that will lead to more crime and violence. The closure of the workhouse is long overdue, not just because of the chronic problems facing the building that include but are not limited to a leaky roof, black mold and inadequate plumbing, the closure of the workhouse is long overdue also because of the inhumane detention of people. The majority of the people locked behind its walls have not even been convicted of any crime. They are being held pre-trial due to their economic circumstances with the average length of stay running longer than 300 days. The workhouse has destroyed thousands of lives all without a trial or due process and continues to ruin lives while the city fails to act on its legal obligation to close the workhouse. On July 17, 2020, the Board of Aldermen voted unanimously to close the jail and Mayor Krusen signed it into law a week later. Nearly 200 days have passed since this vote, yet our elected officials have missed key deadlines and failed to fulfill their legal obligation in closing the workhouse, making false accusations and irrelevant excuses instead. Every day the workhouse remains open and is a day that money, which could be used for our communities, is being wasted. Board Bill 167 will defund the workhouse as of April 1st, 2021 and transfer 3.1 million to the City Justice Center Division of Supportive Reentry and Re-Envisioning Public Safety Trust Fund. This bill is criminal justice reform, taking money out of a failed system and reinvesting it into those most directly impacted and the communities that need it most. 
by closing the workhouse and reallocating those funds to policies and programs that address the root cause of crime, it would not only reduce the need for the workhouse itself to remain open, but would reduce the need for more police, jails, and other failed practices that are a drain on our resources and community. Please support Board Bill 167 and thank you for your time. All right, thank you very much, Emily. Uh, we will go to speaker number 10. It's Toby, is it Mataba? Toby? I know they won't be able to make it today. I'm sorry, Alder, Alder and Volmer, but I know they won't be able to make it today because they had uh, car problems and they weren't able to log on. Okay, thank you very much. We'll move on to speaker 11, Sarah Hofkamp. Sarah, are you with us? Yes, can you hear okay. me? Yeah, we can. Please state your name and then you can start. And we'll start our stopwatches. Okay, just one moment. Um, can you still hear me? Yes, we can. Here is freezing. I'm sorry. Okay, okay I'm Sarah Hofkamp. Um, I'm a resident of the 15th Ward, and I'm here as a concerned citizen and a future teacher in support of Board Bill 167. I'm going to start by saying that I'm deeply disappointed in the city of St. Louis and its failure to close the workhouse, even though the, the Board of Alders, the mayor, and others unanimously voted to do so by the end of 2020. Honestly, it feels like y'all are trying to pull a fast one on the citizens of St. Louis. And I'm trying to remain open and hopeful that I'm wrong um, and that there are some really reasonable explanations for this lack of movement and action in executing the purpose of Ordinance um, 71217. I see Board Bill 167 as an opportunity for you all as elected officials representing me and my fellow St. Louisans to make good on your word. It seems um, to me as though Noel and Alderwoman Rice have provided you all with a carefully craft crafted plan that is viable and even ideal at this point. Members of this committee's potential decision to dismiss it is neglect neglectful of your position in office. Um, you're representing the city. Um, you promised me and the rest of the city that you would close the workhouse and the workhouse is poisonous to the public health of the city. It's pathetic. It's embarrassing, but most importantly, it's actively harmful to people who are detained there, to their children, to other members of their families, and to the community. The arrest and incarcerate model of public safety and public health does not work. You all know this as well as I do, at least you should, because I have been present in meetings in which the data was carefully presented to all of you. The fact remains that the majority of folks in the workhouse are there because they do not have the money to post their bail. This system at its core is evil, it is unjust, and every day past December 31st of 2020 that the workhouse remains open is a shame. If you truly believe that this bill is not feasible, then I implore you to do your job and work together with these experts to craft a plan that will work and execute it. Work together to mold this plan into something that is feasible. Do what you can to make St. Louis better. Please, that's what we pay you for. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. And speaker number 12 is Tracy. Is it spies as it sounds? Tracy? Uh, thank you, it's it's actually spies. I, that's why I asked, I wasn't sure. I didn't wanna say, but well, I was, I once you state your name uh, and, and we'll start the clock and please proceed at your leisure. Certainly. Um, Thanks for taking public testimony today. Uh, my name is Tracy Fantini Spees and I'm a resident of the 11th Ward. I'm here today to speak in favor of Board Bill uh, 167. Um, as some of the previous speakers have noted, um, residents of the city of St. Louis have been hearing lots of excuses from Alders and the Cruson administration on why we can't or couldn't close the workhouse in accordance with ordinance 71217. We've heard things like we can't close it due to COVID, even though the ordinance was passed during COVID. Um, oh, it only calls for a plan, not actual closure. I think uh, Alderwoman Rice addressed that. The only place for detainees to go is the jail hours away, yet we haven't put out any RFPs um, to local jails. Um, and there's not enough room at CJC, despite the fact the city houses federal detainees at a financial loss. Um, and since last fall, the numbers of federal detainees held by the city was removed from the in inmate population data around the time uh, Commissioner Glass gave his report. Um, 
I also hear, oh, it's not our job. We have no power over bail hearings. Uh, and the one of my favorites, the MSI detainees themselves don't want it to close. Um, the campaign to close it is not black led and only white progressive activists want, want it closed. And uh, my personal favorite that um, the people here like myself testifying today are, support, are, uh, are paid for our testimony. Um, I can assure you that the many times I have testified before the Board of Alders, um, I have never been paid for my testimony. Um, this is my time away from my job and my family, like many of us. Um, and I, I may be a white progressive uh, anti-racism activist, but I don't think somebody needs to be black to fight against racism and racial injustice. Um, but if some of you don't wanna listen to me because I'm a white progressive, then you should listen to me because I'm a taxpayer of the city. Every day the workhouse remains open, money that could be reinvested in the affected community is wasted. I do not want my tax dollars spent to further the failed arrest and incarcerate model of public safety. All of the time that the Board of Alders spends debating performative non-binding votes and resolutions is nothing but an effort to kick the can down the road and say that you did something. I am demanding that you do more, much more. I want my tax dollars invested in reimagining public safety as the ordinance uh, uh, indicates and addressing the root causes of crime, which is poverty. This would eliminate the need for jails like the workhouse and spending over half the city's budget on policing, prosecution and incarceration. So that's why I'm asking you to vote yes today on board bill 167 and hold yourselves and the Cruson administration accountable for doing what you said you would do close the workhouse and reinvest those dollars into the effective Ten seconds. Community. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Speaker number 13 will be Megan Betts. Megan, are you still with us? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? All right, yes, we can. Uh, once okay. you state your name, we will start the clock if you have a clock. All right. Okay, all right, hello. Um, hello all, my name is Megan Betts and I am speaking in support of Board Bill 167. I'm a resident of the St. Louis Place neighborhood in the fifth ward. Uh, for 2020, my neighborhood saw an increase in crime and tied with uh, Columbus Square neighborhood and Old North neighborhood for the most homicides in the fifth ward. In my neighborhood, I have seen Action St. Louis out knocking on doors multiple times. When it comes to hearing what citizens want, groups like Action St. Louis are the only ones knocking on our doors. Our residents have spoken and they are ready for us to find ways to rehabilitate rather than incarcerate. We just said no to a president that was based in law and order and devaluing of human life. Today, our current president is outlining his racial equity plan. One of those actions he just signed today was to direct the attorney general to create no new contracts with private prisons. This, just like defunding the workhouse, are the beginning steps we must take to begin reforming our current system. We must invest in the whole person and the whole community. Research after research shows that we cannot police our way out of crime. We cannot surveil our way out of crime and we cannot lock up our way out of crime. This bill in front of you begins the process that was promised to citizens from board bill 93. It is a plan. We cannot keep passing legislation and then not following through. Our communities deserve action. If you wanna put St. Louis on the map as a city that is making the right steps towards equity, then moving this bill onto the full board is the right path. I ask you to invest in our communities and defund the workhouse. There we go, Megan, thank you very much. I was muted myself, I had to choose, so I didn't wanna make any noise, I apologize. So uh, speaker number 14, is it Chicharwa? Masimba, do I have that correct? Hello? Is speaker number 14 with us? No, I don't hear no, no answers. Okay. We will then move on to speaker number 15, Sierra Rebels. Sierra? Do I have Hello. that correct? Is it Rebels or? Uh... Yeah, that's right. Cool. All right. Once you state your name, we will start the clock. Uh, feel free to proceed at your, your own pace. 
Hi, um, my name is Sierra Revels. I'm a resident of the 24th Ward. Um, so yeah, I want to emphasize again, I'm here on my own volition. I'm not employed by anyone or being paid to be here just as a concerned citizen. I'm testifying in support of Board Bill 167. Um, I appreciate all of the concerns um, that alders have raised today at this meeting. Um, it's been very interesting to hear about like the complexities of this issue and this bill. Um, I agree with closing the workhouse for a number of reasons that have already been stated. Um, so I encourage all of the alders to work together. And if you really do believe that this bill will not work, perhaps propose another plan to close the workhouse. I appreciate like the issues with budget and maybe like policy type of things. So I hope that a compromise can be, be reached either with amending this bill or finding another, creating another bill that makes a better plan. So thank you for your time today. I thank you very much. Okay. Speaker number 16, Anna Ginsburg. Hello, Anna. <laughs> please, please unmute yourself, dear. You're still muted. There we go. Okay, why don't you state your why don't you state your name? We'll we'll start the clock here. I will do that. Hello, Alderman Walmer. It's nice to see you again. Nice to see you, dear. My name is Anna Ginsburg, and I am a resident of the 24th Ward, where I am well represented by my alderman, Brett and Ryan. Um, I would like to talk a little bit of the impact about the impact of pretrial incarceration. Um, and I believe this topic is relevant to the issue of closing the workhouse. Um, the hidden costs of pretrial de detention is a one-year study uh, from 2009-2010 by the John and Laura Arnold Foundation. The research looks specifically at pretrial inmates in Kentucky who are incarcerated. The sample size was more than 150,000. And the study found that inmates incarcerated for more than two days, two days, had a higher risk of recidivism. Um, the prison policy initiative is one of the first all for pretrial reform. Um, it conducted a study of individuals released for pretrial in four states and cities in 2020. And it found that releasing people pretrial does not harm public space. And finally, we know from decades of research by the Justice Department um, when it did this kind of research, and hopefully it will again. Juveniles who have any contact with the juvenile system are much more likely to recidivate. Many of the individuals arrested and placed in the workhouse are not much better than um, juveniles. So I would like the Board of Aldermen um, to consider the reduction of crime and to look at this information and this type of information before making any decisions about the workhouse. Thank you again. Thank you, Anna, very much. Oh, I have a, a quick question too. Do you want a copy of this testimony and um, other uh, other information about this issue? Uh, certainly, you may. You uh, can get it to uh, uh, send it to the clerk, Mr. Kennedy, uh, and uh, he will distribute it to the members of the committee, and we'll make it available to the full board. Also, thank you very much, Anna. Thank you. All right. We'll go to speaker 17, Rebecca Brown Gregory. Rebecca, are you still with us? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. So, so once you state your name, uh, we will start our clocks. Once I get my face ID on here, sorry. No, I can <laughs> All right, so Rebecca, just state your name and then we'll start it after that. Okay. Um, my name is Rebecca Brown Gregory. I'm a resident of Ward 23. And I'm also here to voice support for Board Bill 167. Um, like many folks here, when the board unanimously passed the ordinance to close the workhouse last summer, I felt hopeful and relieved to see progress toward true public safety in our city. So it was disappointing, if not surprising, to watch the mayor together with the Board of Alders almost immediately begin to backtrack on that resolution. 
I've heard the critique that simply closing a building is not true criminal justice reform, and I agree, but you now have before you a plan to close the building and re-envision public safety here in St. Louis. The bill specifically reallocates funds from the workhouse to wards that need it most, so we can finally begin to build up our neighborhoods and provide resources to folks so they never get locked up in the first place. The workhouse doesn't make our city safer. It destabilizes our communities. It has cost our neighbors their jobs, their families, their housing. We have long dumped money into public safety measures that do not work. We have rarely invested substantial funds into programs that benefit our families and our neighborhoods. Stop throwing money into systems that hurt rather than help and invest in the people of St. Louis. We are asking you now to make good on your promise. Take this next step toward a just and equitable St. Louis and close the workhouse for good. <laughs> and let me add one quick thing after listening to some of the back and forth about the technical challenges of closing the workhouse. I'm wondering why in St. Louis is it so much easier to close our public schools than it is to close an outdated and inhumane prison? Follow through on your promise and vote yes on board bill 167. Thank you for your time. All right, thank you very much. Okay, speaker number 18, Ann Schweitzer. And there you go, Hello. please unmute. State your name and, and, and I only know this because I read things. A couple of the people on here are candidates for the current election. Are you, are you not a candidate for Alderman currently? I am, but I'm here today. Oh. In my capacity. Well, well, I'm just asking, I understand that, but just for the public record, you have to state that when you state your name that you are a candidate for whatever ward is you're running in. Okay? Can do. Thank all right, once you do that, we'll start the clock. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ann Schweitzer and I'm a resident of the 13th Ward where I'm also a candidate for Alderwoman. Thank you, Alderman Vollmer, for allowing me to speak today. There are good questions to ask when we talk about closing the workhouse. And there are good answers to those questions. Where will the people go? To trial, then home, or a rehabilitation facility or nearby jail? What about their families? Their families want us to close the workhouse. What about the people who work there? There are many jobs open in city government. How will we make sure the resources at the next location are better than the current one? By spending available money caused by closing the workhouse on improving the justice center, funding re rehabilitation and funding crime deterrence. And finally, where's the plan? It's in this board bill. That leaves us just one more question to answer. Why should members of this committee approve an amendment to the annual operating plan to defund the workhouse by April of 2021? That question has three answers. First, the city is legally obligated to close the workhouse by ordinance 71217. Second, there are compelling and better uses for the funds as outlined in Alderwoman's Rice's bill. Third, it's the right thing to do. It's what your constituents have asked for over and over again. It's what we're asking for now. It's time for you to show us whether you are a body that takes one step forward and two steps back, or whether you are a body that will boldly move us forward by following the plan set forth by this board bill. It's time to show us whether or not you are a body that will spend its time fighting for resources that deter crime, for resources for future generations so that our children spend their presence in well-funded classrooms instead of spending their futures in a crumbling jail. I respectfully urge you to vote out Board Bill 167 with a due pass recommendation and close the workhouse. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. We will move on to speaker number 19, Anne Louise Schmidt. Anne Louise, are you still with us? Yes, I am. Okay, we can Hi. hear you. Yes. Please please state your name for the record. Hello, Anne, good to see you. <laughs> good to see you. All right, uh, please feel free to start once you state your name and we'll start the class. I am Anne Louise Schmidt and I'm here in a lot of perspectives. Um, I think it's important to say that I have had a family member in the workhouse and I have heard from that family member about conditions in the workhouse. Also, I have um, been involved with the bail project. I've volunteered for the bail project since it got started in St. Louis, practically, or maybe a month after it got started. But anyways, I've been a long time volunteer. So through that 
way I have been interacting with people who have been incarcerated in the workhouse. Um, I joined the Close the Workhouse campaign to help drive people to meetings to learn about why we should close the workhouse. I think it's interesting, I'm sitting here realizing that a lot of us are white females who are speaking. And I wonder how much is that connected to the privilege that we have? Um, I really, I learned a lot about like the privilege to even have time to come to a meeting. Um, if you're poor and you're barely, you're barely making the ends meet, then it's hard to even come to a meeting about an object. Although I am also here to testify that the people I drove to meetings and the people that I have talked to have been black incarcerated at the workhouse people who have themselves told me that they were leading the movement to close the workhouse and that they wanted the workhouse closed and that the conditions are inhumane. Another thing I want to say in things that I've learned is that, um, and I know so many people have talked about this re-envisioning public safety and it truly is a part of the close the workhouse vision because the bail projects posted over 3000 in cash bail and it proves that pretrial incarceration is unnecessary and the city is taking steps to reduce the pretrial incarceration in 2018 only 4% of the city cases oh, in 2018 they only released 4% of city cases on their own reconnaissance but everywhere else got cash bail statistics are improving now the city is releasing 60% of people on their own reconnaissance I just feel like this whole, this, these are the things I've observed in my volunteer positions, and that's what I can speak on, that, um, that there are not, I haven't seen people being paid to come close the workhouse. I've seen people genuinely invested who have been incarcerated, who have come out and said, this is not a, this is not a safe place for us. So, um, Ten that's seconds. what I have to say. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. We will move to uh, speaker number 20, Bill Stevens. Hello there, Chairman and Committee. Can you hear me all right? Uh, we can, uh, Mr. Stevens. Also, it's notated on mine that you are a candidate for Alderman in the 12th Ward, is that correct? Yes, sir, my reputation okay. precedes me. <laughs> well, well, it's, it's a matter of public record that you, when you state your name, please state that also, please. Yes, sir. And once you, uh, once you state that, we'll start the clock. Yes. So my name is Bill Stevens. And as Chairman Bulmer pointed out, I am a candidate for 12th Ward Alderman here in South City. I'd like to say hello to my 13th Ward neighbors, Ann and uh, Alderwoman Murphy. Hey, guys. And also my 16th Ward neighbor, Alderman uh, Oldenburg. So, uh, you know, I, I come today not just as a candidate, but as a private citizen. Um, hard to separate the two to speak in support of Floor Bill 167 because after all, at the end of the day, the workhouse is a well-documented wasteful use of scarce taxpayer dollars. And Board Bill 167, I believe, gives us the chance to set it right. You know, too long has this exorbitant price tag been hanging over our heads, the heads of all of us here in St. Louis City, and hasn't led to useful solutions to prevent crime, which is a necessary situation we must address. We need to recognize people as humans first and foremost and give them the support systems and circumstances they need to succeed. Board Bill 167 gives us a starting place to defund the workhouse, relocate inmates, and redistribute revenue to investing in more in, uh, innovative ways to preventing crime by targeting its root causes and not the results of it. How does it help our citizens? You know, I think we've had plenty of speakers today who've uh, laid out the very tangible benefits of closing the workhouse, but I want to speak to the hope that it provides. It provides our citizens hope, hope for the future of their children who have to live with the decisions we make here today, and the hope for the generations to come. Difficult decisions are required of difficult situations, and this appropriations bill will provide the first of many steps in this difficult process to get us on the right track. So in summation, you know, my name is Bill Stevens, candidate for 12th Ward Alderman, and I support Bill Boer 167. And I, I truly hope that this committee will advance this necessary bill. 
So thank you for your time, everyone. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Stevens. And to our final public input of the day, speaker 21, Madison is Orozco. Madison, correct me if I was saying yes. your last name wrong. Yes, right. that's correct, thank you. Okay, please state your name. Once you do, we will start the clock. Thank you. Um, hello, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. My name is Madison Orozco and I live in the 10th Ward. Um, I'm also the Community Collaborations Associate at Arch City Defenders and an organizer for the Close the Workhouse campaign. Um, and I'm speaking today in support of Ward Bill 167 to defund the workhouse. Each day the workhouse is open, those inside are subjected to horrific conditions, including insufficient heating during this cold winter and COVID-19 exposure. Also, people who are in the workhouse have not even been able to see or have their loved ones come and visit in months because people are not allowed to visit the workhouse, supposedly for the health and safety of the people there. So I find it deeply disappointing and frustrating to see an older person walking around just to try and prove a point when we know that people have not been able to see their family members who are in the workhouse due and kind of under the guise of public of the safety of people there. We talked about the importance of criminal justice reform and supporting detained and other impacted people. Well, defunding the workhouse through Board Bill 167 is criminal justice reform. Keeping the workhouse open is not. This bill closes a hellhole jail and shifts millions of dollars to our communities. This means $750,000 uh, to the City Justice Center to help with the transition of closing the workhouse and providing resources to better respond to and manage the COVID-19 crisis in our jails, which is directly impacting those who are detained every single day. 800,000 to the Division of Supportive Reentry and 1.6 million to the Reinvisiting Public Safety Trust Fund. Very importantly, including 1.1 million in ward capital, um, in ward capital for wards with the city's highest need neighborhoods. This means 1.1 million in funding exclusively for wards whose areas include cities HUD designated, neighborhood revitalization strategy areas and promise zones. This means wards one, two, three, four, 5, 13, 14, 18, 20, 21, 22, 25, 26, 27. Areas that have intentionally been left behind, that have had funding taken away time after time and have been overlooked again and again. Knowing what this funding can do and how far it can go, who it will directly impact and the wards that it will help, the answer is clear. We must defund the workhouse and we must support our communities. Board Bill 167 does exactly this. And for this reason, I ask you to vote yes. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. All right, that concludes our public input and what we will be doing. Uh, Madam Vice, are you still with us? I noticed she left for a while before. I'm back, sir. All right, all right, all right. What we, uh, uh, if there, before I go through the board, I, Alderman Rice, any closing comments you or Noel would like to uh, go through before we open back up to, uh, Final questions and comments from the committee. Yeah, absolutely. Um, actually, Noel has a couple of uh, points. If, if I'll let him speak first. That's fine. It's your, it's your bill. Thank you. Thanks, Alderwoman. I'm just going to make a few technical points on this bill before wrapping up with some next steps. Um, and the first point I want to make is just about the vehicle of the supplemental appropriation. Um, Alderman Boyd, you're not wrong that this is an unusual approach, but it's certainly not without precedent. In fact, most recently, Board Bill 52, which included a fiscal note from the budget director, did exactly this. It was a supplemental appropriation which moved money around the budget. Um, and, and in fact, it is the only vehicle that the Board of Aldermen has to move money around the budget precisely because the traditional transfer does go through the Board of Estimate and Apportionment. So we were simply following the lead of President Reed who introduced Board Bill 93 as a supplemental appropriation and using the same vehicle um, for, for the reasons I explained. Uh, if there's an alternative vehicle which, which can uh, allow the Board of Aldermen to weigh in on the budget and enforce uh, its unanimous vote on Ordinance 71217, I'm all ears. The second point I wanted to make uh, was with respect uh, to this uh, really semantic distinction between uh, savings or transfers. What really matters for our purposes and for the purposes of the supplemental appropriation is that should we close the workhouse by April 1st, 2021, there will be a $3.3 million operating surplus uh, relative to the uh, appropriated budget. And that's what we're reallocating. 
Now, the points that budget director made ra raised about the revenues are important uh, and, and should uh, affect this bill. And, and I wanna talk a little bit about them. Um, the general fund $800,000 is interesting but not incredibly relevant um, simply because general fund dollars are fungible. Uh, and there's not much of a doubt that uh, we can reallocate funds um, either. I could name a bunch of uh, other sources, including new revenues, um, whether that's fraud and police overtime, which is millions over budget, um, or, or um, the fact that as budget director Payne uh, mentioned, revenues on earnings and payroll are coming in over expectations. But at the end of the day, what it really boils down to is that balancing the budget includes a lot of moving parts. And there's no doubt that we can balance the budget despite a $3.3 million supplemental appropriation. Uh, I was part of two budget processes. And while this is no doubt a very difficult year, um, there remains generally, and I would love to have a deeper discussion and, and dig into it in case I am wrong, but uh, you heard him say in his response that maybe, maybe not, not clear whether he can balance the budget he is very good at his job, and I don't doubt that should we pass this supplemental appropriation, uh, there are the funds available um, in various um, kind of set of sides. The, the point about special revenue is, is interesting. Um, those $1.2 million um, predominantly currently go to fund medical costs. Um, so I, I'd be interested in thinking through if that means that we do need to increase the allocation um, in this supplemental appropriation to medical costs a little bit, especially because during COVID, um, we really want to make sure that we are supporting the inmates there fully. Um, but I would note and qualify that um, by noting that because these are revenues that we receive for taking care of federal and state detainees, I wouldn't be surprised if the reduction of revenues is also correlated with a reduction in costs. Um, so what I'd really love to see uh, from Budget Director Payne is a holistic update that both offers us an update on the revenue side and an update on the expenditure side. Because last time it came in, that was September 30th, um, and we have a lot more information. Um, so I think that's a reasonable next step. A final point I wanted to make um, concerns uh, staffing numbers, and we've heard some concern today from members of this committee um, that uh, folks might lose their jobs. And, and I just want to, again, reassure both that the board bill creates uh, new positions at CJC um, to ensure that managerial level positions are preserved and that lower grade positions um, are fully transferable. Um, that's because right now, we actually recently got updated numbers. Right now, there are 232 people employed at CJC, but the budget is for 316 individuals. Conversely, there are 81 individuals employed at MSI. Uh, so there's actually 86 positions available in the City Justice Center for 81 employees. And as mentioned, we have actually gone into the grades and tried to make sure that these do match up. And, and that's exactly why we provided the three additional managerial level positions, one 18M and two 15Ms, because there aren't those equivalents um, at, at the top end of the pay scale. Um, so those are just some technical points on feasibility, and again, entirely open for friendly amendments that move this forward. Um, because that's what I actually want to talk about in terms of next steps, is that we are on a bit uh, of a time clock here, and we are going to hit the deadline as the Board of Aldermen um, runs out of meetings. And so what I would recommend is to pass this out of committee with a due pass recommendation today so that it can be second read on Friday, but also to simultaneously come back either in this committee or in public safety to hold hearings where we do talk to Dale Glass and we do talk to Jimmy Edwards and we get updated numbers from Paul Payne and we talk to detainees at the workhouse and we can then pass a floor substitute with your input um, that puts together a serious plan to close the workhouse. Um, I, I hope uh, you've heard from so many people today about the need to divest from the arrest and incarcerate model and, and invest in a holistic approach to public safety. Um, and, and I really hope that you take us all up on, on this offer because we put work into putting together a plan. We're not claiming it's perfect, but uh, we need to work together to close this jail. Thank you. Thanks, Noel. Um, and just to close, I don't want to belabor the points. Um, I do thank you, committee, for um, hearing in earnest from the public um, and and walking through this bill with myself and, and Noel this morning. This is a 
creative way to change the way that we do uh, public safety in St. Louis. Um, this is taking money that has been used to hold people pre-trial without conviction um, in a jail that has seen a lot of abuses over the years. Um, and to take that money and put that back into the community to support the people who are going through that justice system and prevent people from coming into it in the first place. This is a humane way um, to move some money around to make people's lives better and to change, uh, to give people some hope in the city of St. Louis. Um, one thing I do wanna address, I was asked earlier um, if as an attorney, I would recommend uh, my client be moved um, to a different location. It would be up to my client and I to have a conversation to figure out what is in their best interest interest. Um, if it is in their better interest to be in a jail that is not the uh, medium security institute because of the cold, because of their ability to access care, um, because of COVID, one of those things that we would discuss that. Um, but I will say it would not be in my client's best interest for an alderman who is not on this committee to go into a facility during a pandemic, putting people at risk, putting inmates and staff at risk when their own attorneys and family members and friends have not been able to see them since March. I, I find it offensive and I, I just have to call that out. Um, in closing, I, you know, I want to bring us back, I would love, to revisit the whole of Board Bill 92, um, Section 5 that says date to discontinue operations of MSI as a detention facility. Our intent when we put this bill forward was to close the workhouse. We all joined together in that. This is, this is not an oppositional process. We have the ability to work together as a board. Um, I would welcome amendments uh, to clarify measures if they, those are necessary. Um, I think that we can get this done for the city of St. Louis and I would ask for your favorable consideration of Board Bill 167. All right, thank you, Alderwoman. Thank you all. Uh, we'll go through the committee. Uh, Alderman Davis, any uh, questions or comments uh, of the sponsor or, or Noel? I'm just gonna make a brief uh, comment. Uh, based on all that I've heard uh, today, I am extremely uh, in need of some very specific information on where we are in this plan. I need to have actual data on the cost of relocating the prisoners because just a little simple things like additional costs for travel, bringing them back and forth to court. Uh, we don't know what another entity is gonna charge us for um, housing them. Uh, it's just a number of things that we don't have yet. And so for me, I need those things and I want to see um, Commissioner Glass bring us up to date because the plan has to be finalized at some point, because if we don't finalize it and send it to the appropriate entities that have to evaluate it and determine whether or not the plan is sufficient to close it, and if we've met all the regulatory requirements in our plan to move them, uh, it's all for naught. And the, the, the part with the budget with uh, Paul Payne it basically says we have no savings. So um, I, just I just need that, that's all. Uh, and, and we have to move forward because I can't, I've said it over and over again. We do, and Noel knows this, we do not have the power to just simply go and send everybody out the door and lock it. There are other entities and agencies that must give approval to all of this. So. Um, Let's get that plan finished. Thank you. All right, thank you, Madam Vice. Alderman Carl. Yeah, a couple of comments. One to Alderman Alder Woman Rice. I went in there prior to the COVID, so now you don't have to be offended. How about to the people that are watching this? That when I get a text from one of my people, rather than turn my camera off, I turn because his house has been burglarized but yet they want to put on Facebook, I'm not paying attention. I'm going to tell you right now, without, you, you can put all two, 300 people again on Facebook. I won't be the deciding no vote. I'll be the first no vote on this. I am not, I, even after everybody I've heard from, 
first off, when people treat me like the way they treat me over how I vote, I am about getting upset. I have talked to those people in the workhouse and it was prior to COVID. I was in there with John. I have not, I'm being accused of being everything that I'm not. Where I'm at on this, even after listening to everyone, this is not about criminal reform. You were still gonna lock people up. We're still gonna put them somewhere and probably somewhere worse. Let's talk about real criminal reform. Let's talk about getting into big brothers and big sisters. Any one of the people that are on this should get in it. Jeffrey Boyd's little brother is a police officer in the city now. He started with a young man. I started with Michael, a young man who is now serving in the Navy on the SS Harry Truman. Get involved. Do you want to talk about doing the right thing? Start helping children at a young age become big brothers and big sisters. But this is not criminal reform. This is let's shut a building down no matter who we hurt. You can go ahead and tweet or whatever so that they don't say, well, Joe was a deciding vote on vote no for this. I'll be the first no vote. And all my Facebook friends, which they like to pick on me all day, they like to make up stuff. Today, someone put on Facebook that I'm going to resign after I get elected. Another piece of BS. They put whatever they want. And the majority of the people in my neighborhood are not for closing the workhouse. It's not going to go on the ballot. That was killed. Okay. And that's fine. That building is a building. It's not criminal reform. Show me where that people are going that's going to be better for them than the workhouse. Show me how we deal with the somewhat of a riot or discontent that they had. So they had to shift 40 something people over from the justice center, where in my understanding, in order to get that under control, they had to use tear gas and whatnot. So what, what, are, you, what are you gonna do? Just beat them back into their cells? You can't overcrowd. This is not criminal reform. And I'll go back to, again, shutting Larry Rice's building down did not do anything for homeless people, but put them on the street and put them in a worse situation. I made it perfectly clear. I don't care about that building. I care about the people in the building. I am so sorry that the majority on this people, including the older woman who brought this about, are more concerned about a building than the people in the building. I am so upset that I'm being made out to be some bad guy because I actually care for the people in that building. And so when you get on there and you are so upset that even the families can't go in there. I went in there before COVID. I've been in there a lot. I've asked the sponsor of the original bill, Dan Gunther. I asked to close the workhouse people to go in there. They said, well, they're going to make everybody clean it up. I said, go in there as a surprise. I did. Uh, you know, um, uh, uh, the 15th Ward Alderwoman and some friends went in by surprise. They didn't ask. This is about, for me, it's about the people in the building, not the building. And I can tell you right now, I care about the people in the building. And if you want to write nasty stuff and lies about me on Facebook, go for it. Because you do anyway. You do anyway. So while we're in this meeting, because I turn to answer a text that I got three because the house was being burglarized in my neighborhood, they put my picture on Facebook and say, I'm not paying attention. I stayed in every one where Alder Woman Spencer for the last three meetings has had nothing but technical problems because she don't want to answer any of this. Let's hide in the background. Let's hide in the background. Oh, I got technical difficulties, so I cannot. Well, thank you for technical difficulties just then. Maybe she can answer a few questions. She apparently doesn't like to answer. She has a lot of technical I, difficulties. Uh, I am Joe, I, no, no disrespect. I am tired of being abused because I want to protect the people in that building, not 
put them in a worse spot. And I want that statement out there. And so they don't have to put, I was a deciding vote. Then Lewis was a deciding vote. Anybody they don't like was a deciding vote on whatever they don't want to do. I'm not the deciding vote. I will be the first no vote on this committee. Thank, right, thank you. you all. Thank you, Alderman. All right, Alderman Howard is not with us today. Alderman Tamika Hubbard. No questions, Mr. Chairman. All right, thank you very much, Alderman. Alderman Murphy, any questions or comments? Uh, no questions. I definitely uh, would like this to move forward. Our intent was definitely to, to, to close the workhouse in a fair and equitable way. And I definitely would like to see that happen, uh, but not at the expense of any one person or it has to be done properly is my concern so that it sticks. That, that's all. My, that's my comment. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Owen Spencer, I see your face. Do I hear your voice this time? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you hear my voice? We can. That's great. I uh, was having some, as mentioned, technical difficulties. I'm certainly not the first, uh, nor will I be the last. I will keep my uh, comments germane to the bill before us. We've been here for some time. I just want to thank everyone for coming today, for sharing your stories, your experiences, uh, some of which were very personal, some of which were very tragic. Um, thank you for sharing them and being uh, uh, before us today to advocate for policies you believe in um, as volunteers, many of you, most of you, those of us who are making this decision were paid uh, to make it for you. Thank you for electing us and for trusting us to represent your best interest. Um, and um, I uh, am grateful to the sponsor and the work uh, that, uh, that has gone into this bill. And uh, I don't have any questions. I just wanted to address the fact that, um, you know, uh, these are many volunteers. They're really touching stories and I'm, I'm grateful to have the opportunity to listen to them today. Mr. Chair, I have to recognize you for uh, having this hearing, for conducting it, um, and for allowing us to spend this time deliberating this important issue. Thank my committee members for uh, being here today. Um, it's a long meeting and it's been contentious, but certainly uh, I think this has been one, uh, time well spent. Uh, so thank you for that. So I have Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the opportunity and I appreciate uh, your consideration and uh, quite, I appreciate uh, the you know understanding nature with which you handled my technical difficulties earlier today. No worries, no worries. Anything else would you like, is that all? That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Alderman. Alderman Muhammad. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to thank the uh, residents who came and testified at today's hearing. Um, and thank you for your leadership, Mr. Chairman. I would also like to recognize Alderman Vicaro, the Chairman of Public Safety, who has held numerous, several uh, public hearings about close the workhouse and about redirecting funds to uh, our community and who also was the first uh, chairman of public safety to establish a subcommittee on corrections to further investigate the problems at the workhouse uh, in about our criminal justice uh, facilities here in the city. Uh, I think that this is a very uh, controversial issue, of course. Uh, I stand by my comments that I have made uh, several times prior to today. I do not believe that closing uh, the workhouse is criminal justice reform. It's closing a building. Uh, we, we are not addressing the root causes uh, that put people into the workhouse. We're not talking about poverty. We're not talking about economic opportunities or economic access. We're not talking about struggling schools, uh, which we have no control over here in the city of St. Louis as Alderman. But there's so many things that we are not talking about. And I do not want this to be window dressing as if it is criminal justice reform. Now, if we're talking about a deteriorating building that needs to be closed, and let's, let's have that real conversation, but let's not, um, let's not use this issue uh, uh, as a remedy to criminal justice uh, reform in our city. I appreciate the sponsor of this bill, Alderman Woman Rice, my colleague. Uh, she answered most of the questions that I have. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I do have one more question if the auto woman from the 8th uh, will be so kind to ask if that is uh, approved by you. No, I'm sure. All of them on the 8th, we yield the question from the auto the 21st. Absolutely. Hey, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much, uh, auto woman Rice. Just, just a quick question. Um, would you, 
would you be willing to uh, hold off on this board bill until the public vote takes place in less than a month from now? At the moment, we don't know if a public vote is even going to happen. It's my understanding that the deadline to get the bill to the public or to the board of elections is today. So I don't believe that's going to happen in time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Alderman, for that. I know, I think we're still waiting for a legal opinion from the city councilor and from the board of elections about that. We haven't received it yet, or I know I haven't. I guess we're still waiting for that. That's my only question. Uh, I appreciate you all, the woman. I appreciate the workers of Close the Workhouse. Uh, and I appreciate the people who also uh, don't believe that closing the workhouse is the right thing to do at this time. Uh, nothing else, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you all. Hi. Thank you, Alderman from the 21st. We will go to Alderman from the 16th, Alderman Oldenburg. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I also want to um, recognize the citizens, residents, the taxpayers, um, the folks from our city defenders, all the advocates around this issue uh, for coming and testifying today. I, I, um, without a doubt, and uh, as sincere as I can say it, I, I recognize the passion around uh, this particular issue, particularly around criminal justice reform or re-envisioning the way we have incarcerated and the way we see criminal justice in this country. Um, I will say uh, further commenting though, uh, Mr. Chairman, and I'm not sure it's certainly at your discretion, but I would have liked to have heard from uh, Commissioner Glass um, and a few more folks from the workhouse or the MSI center, um, as well as um, some more information from Judge Edwards uh, and uh, really uh, reinforcing or re you know confirming um, what Paul Payne's assumptions were uh, today around the budget process and the, the savings uh, or, or really just uh, line item changes that's taking place here today. So, you know, I will say I don't have enough information, I think, to to fully uh, put a, an affirmative or a negative on uh, this um, quasi supplemental appropriation uh, that's in front of us. So I will leave you with that comment. All right. Thank you, Alderman from the 16th. Alderman Boyd, any questions or comments of the sponsor? I just have a comment. Uh, I appreciate everyone that has come sincerely. And I did uh, meet with the OSH defenders and told them I did support the workhouse to be closed. But I also did ask them what was the plan. And so I, I think my frustration is I'm listening to people that are saying that they're citizens, they're registered voters, and that, that uh, they are literally attacking and demeaning the people that's down at the Board of Aldermen trying to do the work. And so we don't have a, <coughs> excuse me, a personal interest or gain to this. But we want to make sure that we follow the federal and state and city guidelines in regards to what we're doing. And so I guess my question is, you know, for a minute, I really felt like I was dealing with people that was up in Washington that had attacked the Capitol because you were literally demeaning us as elected officials and you were literally attacking us as if we're just not paying attention to what our people are saying, and we are. And so uh, I'm just really want to make sure that we're following the guidelines. And Paul Payne kind of opened up some stuff for me that I hadn't even realized and understood. And so I appreciate the sponsor for having him there to do that because he kind of educated me a little more on the, the, the challenges that we'll have in regarding the closing the workhouse. But again, my fear is we have a big building sitting in a ward and I know that you're gonna have to have the utilities on, you're gonna have to have security there, but can we just look at another purpose for that building and not just have a building sitting there? 
And that's what I don't hear. I never hear those answers. And so I, I don't apologize, but I'm kind of appalled because, you know, I was always taught it's three sides to a story. And I'm, I'm not hearing all the sides. I don't get all the information, but I just feel like the people that came to this hearing felt, we don't know what we talking about. We have no idea of what, what we should be doing. And they're intimidating and threatening us. And you do this on Twitter and on Facebook. I just think that is just so embarrassing to me because I don't agree with what you say. So you want to attack people and you want to demean and be disrespectful. And so if that's what our next generation is going to be like, we're in trouble because everybody should be able to have their opinion and people should respect people's opinions. And so, you know, I thank you all for coming and I realize that you're really passionate about this but I need people to understand everybody not gonna always agree and that's just how things work. But we need to come to the table to listen to each other to see what we can do to come to an agreement. Thank you. Thank you, Alderwoman. And Alderwoman uh, Shamim Clark Hubbard. I'm mute. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee and my other colleagues and other people that were here today. We learned a lot today, a lot of testimony as um, as my colleagues said, and we can feel the passion and appreciate people taking the time out that could take the time out. Uh, I do have one question. I'm not sure if I should um, ask it to the sponsor or to Noel, but as it relates to um, some of the things, the concerns I have for the transferring of detainees, can you go just a little bit more into that and let us know, will there any, if you could tell me straight up, will there be any kind of negative impact on the detainees with the transfer and with moving this bill forward? I do. I also want to note that I can appreciate the friendly amendment piece. Thank you, because a lot of people think it's this or nothing. And when we're working together and trying to work together to move something forward, being open to that and work collectively with that, like we all want to do in the best interest of the detainees and the city, but we all did vote again to close the workhouse. Thank you for being open to the friendly amendments. And if you could just touch on that piece about the detainees, because that was one question that I got emailed from one of my constituents. Thank you. All right, Alderwoman Rice, proceed, go ahead. Absolutely. Um, thank you, Alderwoman Clark Hubbard. I, I do want to go ahead and toss this to Noel because Arch City does direct representation um, dealing with folks who are in the workhouse right now. So um, he's got the best expertise to speak directly to that. Thanks, Alderwoman. And thanks for the question, Alderwoman Hubbard. Um, I, I do think it's really important to emphasize that this board bill is designed uh, to serve the detainees and move them into a better living situation. Um, obviously, as abolitionists, our, our ultimate goal is not even to move people to other correctional facilities, but to get them home um, where they are safe. But nonetheless, um, this plan before you does actually provide um, not just funding uh, for the transfer of detainees into other correctional facilities, but actually more than the budget director estimated it would cost. Um, because the budget director estimated that it would cost $460,000 for six months worth of transfer. Um, so that would be $230,000 for three months. We actually allocate $350,000 precisely because, as Alderwoman Davis pointed out, there are these incidental costs with transfers, especially in COVID times with quarantining requirements, which may raise costs. So that's precisely why our approach essentially was to overestimate the cost so we can provide enough money and then through an RFP we can get proposals and then select the most competitive proposal. And that's why you'll note in the bill it says the final expenditure will be determined according to a negotiation, but we want to give at least sufficient money that we are providing and, and transferring detainees um, to a better housing situation. And again, that's why if you look at the terms of the RFP, it's so critical that if and when corrections issues the RFP, it includes the terms included in Exhibit C because it limits it to correctional facilities that meet certain basic standards that are better than the workhouse and that are within 50 miles of the city of St. Louis. Um, so I really did just wanna emphasize that this is designed, uh, this, it's not just about the building. You're absolutely right. It is about the people and this is for the people. 
Thank you. And I can appreciate that you say you're trying to get them somewhere better. I know a lot of us want to work to try to never get them there in the first place. So thank you so much for all the work you're doing. All right. Thank you all the one. Okay. What we thank everyone, uh, first of all, especially all the, the, the public comment, we appreciate everyone taking their time uh, and energy and sitting through all of this and to, to give us your, your heartfelt uh, and passionate concerns in regard to this matter. This is a very, very complicated matter, and we've had a lot to digest today. And what I'm gathering, uh, as I listen, not just only publicly, but from a few texts from uh, board members, and then with Noah actually using the words next steps, deeper discussion, and the point that uh, while I appreciate is wanting to try and get this out and do it uh, with floor substitutes, that's difficult enough sometimes on the floor, but uh, COVID sometimes makes it more difficult. I do plan on having uh, another meeting or two uh, before we go down uh, because I do have another bill that needs to be heard. Uh, what I'm gathering uh, from, from my committee members is that they, they are contemplating amendments, but the time is not, I guess, currently today to, to get them drawn up or, or things. I would also like to hear from Commissioner Glass uh, I'm sorry that we got this bill so late in the session. Uh, you know, that would help us because as we've been going through this and, and procedure is everything, you know, to, to take this down. Uh, and I, 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 uh, I agree, we all did. And, and, the, and the board bill that we passed was to make a proposal to close the workhouse. And I noticed even in your bill, it says that we passed a bill to close the workhouse. I think there's little things that even need to be amended this word wise. Uh, I think we all want to do prison reform uh, and we're trying to do it uh, through this, but I think my committee members uh, for morning hearing would like to get this, would like to hear Commissioner Glass. Uh, today's Tuesday, uh, I, I plan on having a meeting again next Tuesday uh, for our older woman, uh, Tyus's bill, I believe she has one. We could get to yours first. Uh, if we can get some things drawn up, and uh, if you're not, uh, opposed to that, all of them rise. I believe we do need, this is a very complex matter to take a vote. And I'm not getting a lot of, the votes are, are, are torn. I think to get a more positive and get more complete uh, thing going for, for this for this subject, that it would be best to, to hold this and go to another meeting if that's, uh, if you're mean, amenable to that. I understand, I'm amenable. Yeah, because it, it's, uh, this was two weeks ago, we have so much more time to devote to, to, to this and, and it is, uh, you know, un unfortunate that it came to us this late. Uh, I'm Mr. willing to, yes. I just wanted to add, we, we did introduce the bill back in December, tried to introduce it in November, um, and, but it, you know, it was designed for a December um, closure date as well. So there is a lot going on here and I, yeah. I greatly thank you for um, being willing to hear this again. Um, and and I, I look forward to, well, if yeah. anyone would like to contact me and, and work on amendments, I would love to hear them. Well, I, yeah, I, I would, we like to do this the right way. Because uh, yeah. something like this on the floor could get lost completely and misunderstood completely. I, 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 and I want to give everything the, the most fair consideration that I can. I, I believe Thank you. no matter what I believe about anything, I believe everything should be, be done fairly and, and proper procedure. So with that, uh, I will uh, not hold a vote today on this bill. We will schedule a meeting. I'll get with the clerk. I'm shooting for next Tuesday. Uh, and with that, uh, I will thank everyone for the time. I would like to excuse the alderwoman uh, from the 14th for necessary absence. Everyone else is here. Point of I order, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Just really quickly. Um, yes. Do we need to? Do you? Does the committee need to adopt this current committee substitute, or would you prefer to leave entirely that to the next meeting? Uh, we can leave this. We can take this meeting and continue to the next meeting. Is, is my uh, my man advice? Am I not correct? If we or do we need to, you need to unmute. Yeah. Okay, uh, I wanted to share with you that if it was me, I would wait until this additional information that we're asking for, mm -hmm. and hopefully some, um, some consensus on some things before I would put that substitute in. Okay. It, it, there's no sense doing double work. Sure, understood, just wanted to clarify. Thank you so much. Okay, so, uh, and again, technically, uh, I believe we, I don't know if we adjourn this meeting or we, we continue this meeting as the proper uh, procedure. Is that not correct? I don't know if we have the clerk or law. I have a... If you choose to, you can adjourn it because it's, it's not like you're having it 
in the okay. next couple of days. So we have All time right. to All advertise right. thank, the meeting. Thank you so much, Sharita. I appreciate that. She's been sitting there. Hopefully she's not, are you listening to music or are you listening to us? Now, come on. <laughs> All right, folks, I do, again, thank you. I, with that, I will then entertain a motion to adjourn this meeting. Uh, we will be having a meeting hopefully next Tuesday, the time to be determined from the clerk. Uh, and I appreciate everyone's time and effort today. So I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Second. Uh, second. Entertain a second. All right. Second. Okay. With that meeting adjourned, I appreciate everyone's time and effort today. Thank you very much. Thank you.